Okay, it's six o'clock and we have a really big agenda today. So I'm gonna get us moving because the weather is not well and I'm good and I want people that have to drive to be able to get home too. So with that, welcome everybody, it's six o'clock. Thank you for coming to yet another school board meeting. It, welcome to our guests. And so I'm gonna call the meeting to order. And I wanted to start by a quick reflection uh, last, at last week's um, uh, letter from our from Jen, from our interim superintendent, uh, talked about the, uh, the book that the staff had read about uh, cultivating emotional resilience in educators in on concentrating on strengths and looking for the light, especially, you know, right now. It made me think about uh, a book that I've been reading to that a friend gave to me, the Book of Delights. And it's just short essays because it's really hard to, like, this time of the year, as you know, we're all super busy to, like, be able to, you know, read a lot, at least for me right now. So the essays are great because it reminds you of little delights in uh, today I had the opportunity to go to the Callas Elementary School and be with the staff. And that was my delight of the day to make me feel connected to people. And it made me feel, you know, it reminds us of why we're here. So I wanted to start the meeting with that and uh, see if there's any public comments for tonight. I see one, two hands. Okay. So let's start with, let me see, Erica. Hi, I'm Erica Rose. I'm the art teacher at both Callis and Berlin Elementary. And I am strongly advocating for an increase of the art position from 0.8 to full time for Callis and Berlin so that we can better serve our staff and our students. You will note later in your meeting tonight during the presentation from the leadership team that I have the support on this request from my building administrators, Aaron and Kat, but this increase is not reflected in the draft of the budget you are looking at. I am asking the board to direct the leadership team that art is a priority in Washington Central. This is what my position looks like four months into the school year as a result of last year's cuts. My working days are typically nine to 10 hours long. I arrive at school around 7.30 and I often stay until about 5.30 every day, Monday through Thursday, so that I am prepared for my 15 classes each week. My Tuesdays are split between Callis and Berlin and sometimes it is difficult to take my allotted time for lunch. While all teachers have some level of planning outside of the school day, I still work at home despite my long hours and occasionally come in on a weekend. Four days is not sufficient if I want to plan and prepare engaging lessons, stay up to date on student concerns, and collaborate with all stakeholders across two very different communities. I don't have time this year to do many of the things that enriched my program in the past. I will not be able to have an art show. Okay. Hi, Erica. Erica, just hold on, hold on a minute. We, we, we have this policy of having a set amount of time. We just have three people. I'm gonna just uh, check in and see if there's any other, anybody else that is gonna have a comment today. Otherwise we would extend that because we cut you right in the middle. So I apologize for that, but we're gonna make an exception today and just run a little longer it, just because we have just three people, right? There's no other public comment. Okay, so go ahead, Erica. It, I'll just see a few more, a little longer, yeah. not much. I don't have time this year to do many of the things that enriched my program in the past. I won't be able to have an art show, display student artwork at our local library or do other school traditions that my students look forward to. Um, I took this hit on the reduction of art position because I care very much about my program and my students, but my workload is very taxing and not sustainable long-term without jeopardizing the quality of my instruction. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Erin? Thank you. Um, I I've, I've spoke with you uh, several weeks ago about the status for beginning. I just wanted to share with you uh, the recent update. Um, so greeting board members this evening. 
I'm speaking on behalf of the Washington Central Educators Union to provide an update on the 2021 statewide health care bargaining process and its outcome. As you likely know, a panel of three arbitrators unanimously selected the union's last best offer, which consisted of the recommendation of John Cochran, the neutral fact finder, and covers the years of 2023 to 2025. In their rationale, the arbitrators cited the current fiscal health of the state education fund um, and the massive infusion of pandemic recovery money to local school districts and the reduction in property taxes for Vermont residents. The unions, by adopting the recommendations of the fact finders report, accepted concessions in premium cost sharing for support staff and out-of-pocket liabilities for teachers and other licensed professionals. While we were disappointed that the Vermont School Board Association's bargainers position throughout the process, we recognize those positions do not necessarily reflect your views as school board members. We appreciate the opportunity to com communicate directly with you during the bargaining process and hope to maintain a positive uh, dialogue moving forward and during implementation of the new bargaining agreement that begins in 2023. We believe your share um, you share our interest in maintaining a high quality, competitive, and fair health care benefit for employees in the school district. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you, Erin. Dexter? Uh, hi, I'm Dexter Lefebvre from Middlesex, and uh, I wanted to first uh, comment on the draft minutes for the meeting for your last meeting. Uh, they didn't accurately represent. Uh, the testimony that I provided in the meeting. Uh, specifically, I uh, identified that the board was violating their policy of A21 um, that was to allow public comment on each agenda item uh, before it was voted on. Um, I think that it's unreasonable for the uh, board to continue and operate in this way. I think it's also a violation of state statute uh, because you're not providing reasonable access to the public to comment on things. My specific interests are the school's COVID policy. Um, I think the mask policy, masks are dangerous. Uh, making, <clears throat> making masks mandatory is harming children, both physically and psychologically. And the same is true of the testing procedures. They're both dangerous and they harm children physically and psychologically. And I'd like to see more public input into development of, of the process. Thank you, Dexter. That's it for community. I don't see any other hands. Let's move into our, our meeting. And Erin and Dexter, I assume that is an all hand. If you don't mind lowering your hand, that would be great. And then we can move everybody on their screen. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, any agenda revisions for members? I, I, I would like to, I know that we don't have a lot of time, but I would like to add in reports, a quick report in from the Career Center. So call it four points. Uh, floor, it's Anna. I was, um, yeah. Um, would it be possible to move the student reports closer to the beginning of the agenda tonight? Yes, that, 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 that would be okay. That would be okay. So we'll move it. Do you have sports? At what time is, do you need to be done? Um, I don't have any major preference. Um, I just saw in the agenda, it was um, over 100 minutes of the board discussion. So if possible before then, or. Okay, so we can, you know, we can, we can talk, Anna, we were, we were hoping that you guys, we had this conversation at the steering committee, and we, we were hoping that you guys wanted to participate and listen in a little bit into what the, the, the work of the board and then and then report in, but I'm happy to have you report in a, right as we get started today. And then you can decide what part of the meeting you wanna do and engage with. And I see that I have a hand up from Mr. Scott Thompson. Go ahead, Scott. Yes, Flora, I'm wondering if the board should consider instructing our student representatives, teachers, not to assign them homework on board meeting nights. <laughs> Yeah, but I'm not. I'm not going to comment on that. But it, 
let's move in the, the start our meeting and I'm gonna do 3.0, Anna, and just go ahead, do the report, the student report. Let's start with on that note. Okay, thank you so much, Flora. I really appreciate that. Um, I am living in Berlin now, so I might keep my, um, my video off just because I know the Wi-Fi is a little bit bad. Um, I believe Maya is here tonight. Maybe somewhere, yeah. Hi, Maya. Hi, I am here, sorry. <laughs> uh, hey, Maya, do you wanna start us off tonight? Uh, yeah. All right, so we just wanted to start off saying that winter sports are starting, starting up with basketball, skiing, and hockey, and competition starting soon. Um, we're not sure like how COVID will affect them yet, but we're keeping our fingers crossed. Um, along the lines of Chronicle, since I'm the senior editor, I feel it is important to uh, report out about that. So um, in the next coming weeks, we are hoping to publish and print a paper version of the Chronicle. So we haven't done that in a bunch of years, and we're hoping to take a bunch of the highlights from um, this fall semester. So a couple of them um, include a student songwriter who has recorded an album, um, the cross country meet and how the boys won um, New England's, the COVID policies, as well as some um, funny humorous sections of a comic about the toaster at school, as well as um, a consulting like thing from a senior. Uh, as some of you may have heard, we did have a water main break uh, last week and part of this week. And so we did miss one and a half days of school, but hopefully it's fixed now and we won't have to miss any more school because of that. Um, so because it's becoming the holiday soon, um, as part of the pep squad, which is our uh, school spirit club, we are deciding to do a candy cane delivery. So this is going to start on Friday into Monday. And students will be able to purchase a candy cane and have it be delivered to their friend as a way to celebrate the, the happy holiday season. And they'll be delivered on Wednesday. So it's a little bit like if any of you have seen Mean Girls or have heard about um, our Valentine's Day flower sale, it's similar to that. And we're really looking forward to that and also having an ugly sweater day. I did not know that was a thing. Okay. <laughs> um, earlier this year, we talked to you guys about Mosaic, which is a local group whose mission is to heal communities and end sexual violence. And starting last week, students at U32 have started a task force made up of many kids in all grades to help work towards a sexual assault and harassment free school community. And we are currently working with Mosaic and they're like, they're working on plans on how to end it and fix it in our school community. And to just finish up tonight, um, a lot of seniors have applied early action to college and um, those who have applied early action and early decision have been getting their um, applications back and being accepted, which is really, really exciting. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, any questions from board members? Okay. That was a great way to get us started anyways. It's much more interesting than what we're about to do. <laughs> Just, it's okay, let's get into a 3.1, vote to mail annual meeting ballots to all registered voters. It, we're gonna have to table that, that one. We were not able to get our Berlin town and our Middlesex town, but I would love a quick update from, from each town since it just, to go quickly. So Jonas, I'm gonna start with Worcester. Uh, sure, so I went to the last uh, Worcester select board meeting, I believe on Monday the 6th, um, where they uh, voted to send ballots to everyone on the registered voter list, uh, but they also added a clause at the end of their motion uh, to say that um, the towns, all five towns uh, that do this should do it through jet uh, envelope uh, so that they can mail them all out from there uh, instead of sending them back to the town clerks and having them mail them out, right? Just so to to save that step. Um, but there was no, um, there it seemed to be no hesitance on the part of uh, of Worcester to, um, uh, to to do that and to mail out all ballots. Thank you, Jonas. Uh, Lindy, is Montpelier? Um, East Montpelier had no hesitancy about it at all um, and voted to do that as well. Um, we didn't talk about jet service, but I'm sure they would support that. Thank you. 
Callis, Maggie? No issues with Callis either. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jonathan, Ber Berlin, we're waiting on a different, do you wanna share? Yeah, sure. We've uh, contacted the town administrator and, and provided the letter requesting that the ballots be made, uh, be uh, mailed to all the registered voters, uh, but we haven't received confirmation yet back that that's going to occur, but uh, hopefully we'll hear back from them soon on that. Okay. And Chris McVeigh, Middlesex. You're muted, Chris. Uh, I attended the select board meeting. There were some questions about uh, the necessity of, of doing the ballots and um, some select board members had questions, uh, which I couldn't answer, but I've gotten answers and then responding and writing to the town clerk to go to the select board. And it's my hope that they will um, agree. Uh, there was also um, some, some concern uh, about uh, access to the Romney School and Romney School prop, uh, properties in light of our easement. So I think we are addressing that as well. Um, and I think that will help iron things out. Okay. So I'll report back. Thank you. So, so we're going to take action. This needs to be done. It, we, I was hoping that we could get it done today, but we're going to take action in our January meeting, hopefully. Okay. Let's move on to the annual warning draft. That was in page four. We have the finance committee met and we reviewed the draft and we have uh, it. Jen, do you mind sharing your screen? We have an updated draft. Yeah, Mark is prepared to share his screen. Mark, that's sorry. Cute. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, that's good. Mark, are you with us? Yeah. Oops. It is. Can every, I, I can, oh, there you are. Okay. Can everybody see it? So there were two very, very small changes. So if you go down a little bit, yeah, Mark. So one of it, so in Article Five, oop. <laughs> in in Article Five, the Finance Committee was proposing that we change uh, the annual compensation for school di district officers. You see it there, in we can have a discussion. I just wanted you to be able to to read it. Oops, right there. And then the other one was just a minor change uh, above. So nothing that uh, that drastic from, 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 the previous, uh, from the previous draft. Do you wanna stop sharing the screen unless people were not able to read it? So if I could have a motion to accept the draft and then we can move into discussion. So moved. Thank you, Kari. Second. Okay, Kari moves. Scott seconds. A uh, questions and you know thoughts on that. We don't. Yeah, I'm gonna, Jonas. I'm gonna let Kari uh, start so that we can talk a little bit about you know the thought behind doing this. Kari and then Jonas. So I'm not sure if it was clear, but the the first change was to increase the compensation for regular directors by $50 and then to um, create a new level for the board chair. And the thinking is that we should um, slowly uh, but steadily start to increase the compensation for directors over time to address the equity issue that not everyone in our community can necessarily afford to serve on the on the board, they may have expenses. They may need to um, earn more for their time, and um, we want to be respectful of that and um, not increase it in, in large quantities um, right away, but uh, steadily over time. We, one suggestion was to get into a practice of increasing it by fifty dollars a year, and then the board chair amount is just in recognition of the incredible amount of work that the board chair does. It's it's it's. It's certainly undervalued at that proposed level, I would say. I mean, I'm not sure if people understood what the second um, change was, and that was about having a um, in-person 
location for the virtual hearing, which would be at E32. Yeah. Basically, we are just trying to comply with law. We, we just noticed that there was no physical location. So it was, it was very minor, but it's basically why we've been posting right now for our meetings. If, if, we we decided they, they asked me to look into what other uh, neighboring districts did just to have a comparison so i reached out to sonia the chair uh, and she uh, I, in barry they paid uh, twenty five hundred dollars to board members and four thousand to the chair in montpelier they pay a thousand dollars to to the board members and and the chair makes 1500 and in, uh, I didn't get the exact numbers from 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 Harwood uh, because he said the chair the the board members make a thousand, uh, but he said the the chair and the vice chair are paid by meeting, so it sort of depends on. So they get it, they get the same stipend, and then they get money for extra meetings. But so it was too hard to really bring that into comparison. So I just shared the other two, uh, Stephen, Luke. <coughs> I would say if the if the desire is to increase equity, then increasing the pay of everyone doesn't address equity, it addresses equality. If we want to address equity, then I think we take the same pool of money and distribute it based on some factor other than equal distribution. So for instance, um, income level. Um, so higher income level would get paid less, lower income level would get paid more. That would address equity. Um, and I, I don't think the proposal that's being put forward addresses equity. It equally increases the amount of pay for everybody. Thank you, Stephen. Others? Scott? Um, I understand Stephen's point. And um recognize that in a kind of abstract way he's right but i would just note that um it can be you know invidious as well to um essentially discriminate on the basis of uh income where it would have to be it would come out um who has who's making what money and and i think from my perspective Kari's suggestion is, um, you know, the the best compromise to that 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 I can think of. Thank you, Scott, uh, Jonas, and then Chris McBay. Um, I I love the intent of this. Um, instead of slowly bringing those that compensation up. To where it should be um, and I, I completely agree that we need to attract people who you know for for whom that thousand dollar incentive is just not enough um i would i would rather us put an article uh, on the warning that says that we will that we will raise the compensation to something much higher than 1500 but do it for starting in the 2025 26 school year so that everyone who's on the board right now and everyone who might be running for a seat this year would not get that sort of just like the way that we passed the constitutional amendment a few years ago that any increase in pay will not affect current members of the congress um if we do this and put it into effect a couple of years from now i would hope that that would um make it clear that we are not trying to give ourselves more money, but they were trying to uh, to make being on the school board attractive to uh, to people who for whom it might not be attractive right now. Um, so, but I don't have a number and I don't want to pull it off of the top of my head. Uh, and this may not be the year that we do this, but I would suggest that if we're really serious about doing this, let's raise it to something like $3,000, but do it three years from now. Chris, thanks, Jonas. Um, so I would say that we um, make the jump right now um, because if we're waiting for equity or equality, um, delay um, is no one's friend. Uh, so I'd propose that we increase the board member um, amounts to 1500 and double for the chair right now. 
as opposed to wind. Because if we do it fifty dollars a year, that's just the the slow drip of erosion and, and doesn't do anything for equity or equality. Um, and I think Steve makes a great point about equity versus equality. But by having an equal amount that's higher allows more people to serve that might not otherwise be able to. Uh, so it at least it gets tries to get at the problem without uh, requiring uh, disclosures that others may not want to make. Thank you. Thank you. So, do you, are you proposing a friendly amendment, Chris? I, I, I want to give I want to give everybody a, a chance to talk. I also don't want to spend a lot of time on this because we have a really long agenda. Uh, but uh, is anybody? I'm going to ask just: Is anybody in the board opposed to increasing the board pay? I don't see anybody. Uh, Okay, uh, Jonas, that's an old hand, right? Yeah, uh, Jonathan, were you trying to say something? Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was. I was just thinking that, and and maybe this is, in some ways, a, a privileged position to take, which is that, you know, I, I'd like to believe that people would want to serve on the board, uh, but for, you know, earning money to do it. But the reality is, you know. For many people, their time is, it's, our time is always valuable, but, but to do it could be, and to be paid uh, a fair amount of money or some money to do it uh, would make it more appealing for some people. I mean, like I said, I like to believe that people would do it without consideration of the money, but perhaps that's, that's a somewhat um, naive position to take and also sort of a privileged position because um, I think some fair compensation is fair. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Maggie? I just wanted to speak briefly as a board member who didn't know I would be receiving an honorarium until I got the notification I needed to submit information. And I've been on numerous community boards of equally important organizations in our community and never been compensated before. Um, and I think, uh, you know, in terms of attracting people to participate, this could create an opportunity for people who may have <clears throat> um, other commitments that would make participation difficult, um, namely in employment or um, being at home because their significant other is working. Um, and, and this would be somewhat of a burden in terms of their time to find coverage. Um, Thank you, Maggie. So let's let let's vote in the proposal, Chris. If you are okay with that, uh, or you want to do a friendly amendment and I'm, see. I'm going to propose a friendly amendment to increase the um, board members' uh, stipend, uh, and uh, I, I think it needs to be said that even if it's fifteen hundred dollars, um, no one is. I mean. You're not doing it for the money, even if it's fifteen hundred dollars. Um, just let's be fair and clear to ourselves about that, because um, I don't know. I, I've never heard of a board member running so they could get the stipend, um, <laughs> but I think it's a recognition of the time and that we do spend. Uh, and um, and and I, I fully agree with the the board chair um, getting um, twice because of all the uh, work that the board chair has to do. So I'm going to make that friendly amendment to. Uh, increase the um, uh, the Article Five to directors for fifteen hundred uh, e uh, a year and um, the board chair uh, three thousand a year. Kari, would you accept that friendly amendment? I, I completely understand the the thinking on that. I I feel it's too high though. I, I worry that it it would um, backfire on us. And I don't want to get into bargaining, Chris, but okay. uh, no, I wouldn't. I'm not. I'm not going to carry it. Just up or down vote on either one is fine with so me. No. Okay. So let's vote. Let's vote on the motion on the floor right now. It, we didn't have a second for friendly amendment. Carrie didn't take the friendly amendment. So let's vote on the warning as you saw it. Uh, and. Jonas, is that a question or? Yeah, just really quick. If the voters turn down uh, whatever increase we vote on now, uh, the compensation will revert to what it is now. Yeah, yes. $1,000. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay, so just to be clear, it would be a thousand fifty for the for all board members in two thousand and a hundred dollars for the chair. So, all those in favor, please say aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? I abstain. Okay. So one of Stephen abstains. So the motion carries. Thank you. School board elections. In, in page six, everybody got that that memo. It, we coordinated with the, with with Rosie, and it just you know just be aware if you're if you're running. And I, Maggie Weiss uh, sent an email today to her principal and and the town clerk to asking people to run. A, I have a, a draft to be sent after the meeting for the steering committee to post it, something too. We are going to need board members for East Montpelier, for Callas, and for Middlesex. And everybody that you know that you're running, right? Everybody that has been appointed. Is there any questions from that memo? Chris McBay, is that a old hand or a new hand? It is an old hand that I've not been able to lower oh. because I'm not getting okay. access to whatever it is to. Okay, lower. I just I just did it for you. Thank uh, you, Maggie. Maggie. I just wanted to add that Scott has also posted to Front Porch Forum, and I plan to um, post a few testimonials there too. And Kari and Scott and I have talked about being available for folks in Calus who might be interested in hearing directly from us about um, the value of running and participating. Thank you, Maggie. To every every town, please take note. <laughs> And let's move on into town meeting and annual report format. So, Jen, do you have the? <laughs> yeah. So we have two types. So, yeah. do you want to lead this in, or do you want me to? Do you want to lead it? Oh, I'm I'm happy to lead it, okay. and with yeah. Suzanne Suzanne's help because she did some research on the question that came up at finance. So yesterday at the finance committee meeting, a question did come up about the format for the annual report. So I have a little virtual show and tell here. Um, so in recent years, we have done this kind of report. Um, so glossy will ensure it's all photos of our students and uh, Scott Thompson, I did check. There is a place for notes in the back of this one. Um, and and in years past, we had done this version that those of you who've lived in our communities or served our, on our boards will remember. This was the town by town version. Um, not The paper is not as sturdy and um, a little bit of color and then black and white inside. And so there have been thoughts, uh, two different schools of thought about which way to go. So um, with the finance committee asked us to do a little bit of research. Suzanne reached out to Ben Merrill yesterday, who has helped us put these together. Suzanne, can you share the quotes that we got and, and then any price differences just so the board can make this decision? Sure. Great. Uh, the black and white, uh, no color and no glossy is uh, quoted at last year's quantity. Uh, 5985. It is obviously the cheapest. Uh, the surprise for us was that uh, not glossy, uh, but still color was more expensive than a glossy uh, printout. Uh, not glossy, but still color is 7754. And glossy is 7506. So there's only a $200 difference and actually glossy is a little bit cheaper. So I think the other considerations that came up um, are, you know, is this an informative piece just in preparation for our, um, you know, for our annual votes? And or do we want to consider it being a promotional material, especially in the face of declining enrollments? So those were the, that was the, in a nutshell, the substance of the conversation for you, by all means, yes. facilitate this part, but that's the background information. 
Yeah, thank you, Jen. So the finance committee felt that this was a board decision. We had a lot of feedback from, from different town people in the past couple of years. Uh, and and uh, Lindy, this is a separate conversation about the format and what we'll share with the towns. Right now, we just want, and I'll, I'll give you an update on that too. Uh, but right now, what we want to talk is just about the report itself. If the, I think if we look at it as a promotional material, it makes sense. And if we look at the cost, uh, I'm going to revert from what I was thinking at the finance committee of going with the simple, uh, the simple one. But it, what is the pleasure uh, of, of the board? And do you guys have any questions? Diane. So um, one, and Jen already talked about this. I think it's the, for, uh, the information to me is more critical than the format to a certain extent because we got a lot of feedback about um, lack of information, which I think, Flora, you, you said we're gonna talk about. But I wonder about the environmental impact, which one has the least footprint? as part of it. Um, I think we have to be mindful of um, what we're putting out there in terms of optics, but also what environmentally makes a better choice. Thank you, Diane. It, Maggie? And I just want to say my video is off because I have a kid watching the basketball game and the internet is really poor here. So I apologize for not having video on. I'm sacrificing for the U32 games. Um, so I, I'm just looking for clarification on what we mean by this being promotional material. Who's the, who's the audience for promote, being promoted to? So mainly it's, it's community members and community members sharing it with other community members. It could be realtors sharing the, the, the report. It's, it's brought, like today, I, I couldn't find mine. I went to Callas and I picked up one at the door, right? So they, it's, it's just available. So that's what it would be promotional. And we don't really have anything else in, in, in print and it just gives an insight into the schools. And, and the reason I ask that specifically is because generationally, if we're talking about attracting new families, we really should be looking at a stronger internet presence because the utilization of print is just not going to be as, it's not going to be as accessible. If you had to drive to Callis to pick up a book, you know, why is that not immediately and easily accessible on our website in a beautiful full page PDF, easy to flip through page form. Yeah, also it, would, would, it, it would be available online. It's always available online. It will be available online. But is it accessible and easy? You know, is it accessible? Is it right? Is it, uh, <clears throat> I think we're talking about um, uh, an advertising approach that isn't necessarily um, appropriate to the time. Okay. Thank you. I'm suggesting Thank you. it's outdated. Uh, Stephen and then Lindy. I think any dubious marketing um, gain is um, minimal compared to the negative feedback we get from community members um, on the glossy. Um, platform. I think if, if we're interested in trying to sway community members to more community members to support the school, um, then we want to be super sensitive to costs and super sensitive to the feedback that we get from community members. So I think we should go with the lower estimate. Thank you, Stephen. Hey, Lindy? I really feel it's about the content of what's in this. And I know you said we're going to talk about that, but that's what the com um, that complaints we had gotten. The glossy, it was just pictures of school. You know, the it didn't have data. Some of the recent ones didn't have the data that people were used to, I think. And by it not being in the town reports anymore, they were asking questions about why, if we're going to do this, we don't put that information in there so that it's informative in that sense. But the complaints, I agree totally with Stephen. If 
the the glossy look of some bank has sent you something is not what they're thinking of for their public schools. And it may be wrong as far as looking at the glossy cost being cheaper than the not glossy, but just pictures of kids at recess or doing math or something is not that informative of our schools. And it's mailed to every family. Some of them have children now, some of them had children before, some of them will have children or never have children. They want information, not just um, how, how great we look or whatever. So that's what's important to me is the content if we're going to do it in print. Thank you, Lindy. So Suzanne, can you refresh? I'm getting confused now. So the 5985 was non-glossy, but it, but still color. No, oh, black and white. Black and white. Black and white. Okay, black and white. Okay. But the less the one that we have been printing before was the most expensive. No, it was the middle. It was the middle. Okay. All right. So. And it's only two hundred dollars less than the non-glossy color. Yeah, it's seventy-five. Yeah, oh six to seventy-five. Okay, so what would be I, as far as content, uh, Diane and Lindy, what uh, Suzanne had sent an email, and what we were what we were hoping is to be able to share the information with the town clerks this time around, so we would have it in a format that they can share it. It, what we're not going to include is the salaries. We, we, you know, we crossed that threshold last year, and we were going to post that on the on the website eh, as we had agreed last year. But other than that, we are going to be able to have the information in a format that the towns can use it. So that's a change from last year, and then we're going to have this this report. So and that there's that question and coordinate with them. Lindy? Yeah, it's it's not so much the salaries that were they were in all of our town reports, but um, numbers of classrooms, student numbers. Those are what I think people like to see. Um, it shows over time our numbers by community, the schools. And I, I hear people complaining that we've lost our sense of community by having one board. But if we have a document that includes information about each school like that, like how many grades and classes are at Berlin, East Montpelier, Callis, how many students are in the schools, how many are in pre-K, those kinds of change, that's information people like to see and they don't know it just looking at a building. So it wasn't so much down to the salaries um, cause I know when I taught here, it was like a shock. What my salary's in the town report, but I got used to it. Um, and I, I think it's more those kinds of census numbers and how many faculty members, because we always had a list of faculty members. It's nice to know who's working in your schools. I don't have to know exactly. I can look at the contract, figure out how much of the money they're making. Um, so those were the numbers that have been missing. And if it's going in this report, fine. But this report needs to say more than just, oh, look at all the great artwork that our kids are doing or the playground and things like that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Lindy. Uh, Diane. So, so I would, I mean, I'm just remembering there was some feedback after our uh, budget forums, um, especially when we were looking at some of the specifics. So uh, I'm gonna look back on some of that feedback just to remind myself what it was. But I also wonder if there isn't, um, you know, if we had a draft at the next budget forum and that we get the feedback as to what are the parts missing. Cause I, I agree with Lindy, it's really the picture of the, the people in it. It's, it's not the detail about salaries, but it was, there was a number of questions or confusion as we presented a consolidated budget, which I just think we have to be mindful of how the information feels to those who aren't inundated and immersed in it. Thank you. 
So we, we're taking note of all of this. We will talk about the format of the report. We have notes from uh, all of the feedback that we got back after last year report. And that's what we were using with Suzanne to try to make sure that we check that. <laughs> it, so we, this is all important. So would everybody just by a show of hands be comfortable with going with the, with the middle uh, one? So not black and white, but the middle number. No, you want black and white? So we have one, okay. Who, who wants black and white? Laura, could we have a motion that we vote on and then we can figure out? I, I, I was just trying to get a sense, uh, Stephen, to just be able to just put a motion for that particular one, but so I didn't want to have to do two, but okay, go ahead, make a motion. I, I make a motion that we accept the lowest bid. Second. And second by Jonas. Stephen, any more discussion on that? All those in favor, please say aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 It looks like everybody. Who am I missing? And any opposed? So I'm, I'm gonna oppose, sorry. <laughs> and then any abstentions? All right, so we'll, we'll do the black and white report, which is the lowest number. Uh, for, uh, just a comment in terms of, um, we yeah. talked a little bit about not putting the salaries in the report. Um, we should at least put an asterisk or something saying, if you want to see the salaries, they're on the website. Just yeah. so that people don't have to hunt for it. They know where they can look. Because that is of interest to a certain segment of the population. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Let's move on. Superintendent evaluation, Carrie. Yep, so um, hopefully the memo in the packet was helpful, but um, just to remind everybody, our goal is to conduct an evaluation this year, but with an eye towards future years, so we can develop a system that we can use in future years. And uh, to that end, the committee um, has learned a little bit about the Vermont School Board Association's system that they use, and we would propose using that system this year um, it utilizes a survey that's focused on the job description, um, you know, a, sort of a generic job description for superintendents, um, and then any goals that have been established. And the way it works is the survey is sent out electronically to board members, to the superintendent, and to the leadership team. And then our thought was, as a committee, was that we could supplement that with climate survey data so that we're getting input from groups and we thought specifically that it would be interesting to um, go on an alternating basis, one year uh, survey students and families and the next year sur survey staff. And then beyond that, we're thinking even more specifically, given the timeline this year and our capacity, every all the challenges, why don't we start the climate surveys next year, specifically with the staff, and um, if, if you like that idea, then we would just basically focus on the evaluation instrument this year. And um, we would have uh, the association support in compiling the results and, and, um, and writing it all up. So that's the, that's the summary. Uh, happy to answer any questions and, um, and love to hear your comments. Thank you, Carrie. Any questions from board members? I see none. Let's move right along. Uh, superintendent search appointment. Looks like Scott Spain. has one. Oh, sorry, sorry, Scott. I didn't see you. Okay, go ahead. No, thank you. Thanks, Kari, for flagging me. Um, I noticed that in the rubrics, there are something like 40 separate performance points. That's a lot. And I think um, it, it might be a good idea to try to, uh, at once, 
you know, we work through this to, to have some sort of sense of priority because um, particularly in times like these, uh, I, I don't, uh, it's going to be really hard for any mortal human being to um, excel in every single one of those 40 areas. Um, so I think it'll be necessary to just help provide some guidance as to what to focus on and, and make sure that um, there are no kind of, um, I don't know, potential for gotcha uh, situations, um, just, to, just to make it, you know, um, work well for, for both the superintendent and the board. Thanks, Carl. I think that's a great point. And um, I think, um, you know, Jen would be the first to admit the job of the superintendent is incredibly challenging. No one is, excels at everything. Everyone has room for uh, improvement and growth. And that's part of the deal with the evaluation as we, we um, agree on where those opportunities are together. Um, but thanks, thanks, Scott. I appreciate that. Jonas? Yeah, I see that as more of a feature, not a bug. I think in the previous evaluation process, we had too few performance points um, and there was just not the ability to get the kind of detail and granularity we needed to get to, um, you, know, a, you know, so that each member of the board felt that they were accurately um, assessing uh, the superintendent's performance based on the evidence and that, you know, the board members uh, experience of working with the superintendent. I think that certainly could be cut down, um, but I think the going going with with more rather than fewer uh, is a good thing. We can always trim it down later. Um, and you know, I think as 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 Kari says, you know, there are always going to be areas where the superintendent did not do an excellent job. I think that that's just everyone being honest. Uh, about that and having a rubric where we can actually identify that rather than bucketing, you know, a lot of different points into one category where there's not room for a lot of variation, um, I think is a good thing. Thank you, Jonas. Any other questions for Kari? Seeing none, let's move into the appointing for the for the superintendent search. Uh, I sent an email just this afternoon because we closed at noon the applicant uh, pool. I don't know if you all had a chance to, to look at that at that email and that in that little table. And within that email I had sent you know a proposal for for three criteria or whatever you want to call them, but uh, to the extent possible, let's look for town representation. Uh, that we have elementary, middle, and high school representation and an equity lens. And we also received a letter from Kara this afternoon. So take that into consideration that, that we also have uh, teachers. Um, so with that, uh, I thought that we would break it up uh, and start with the students, <laughs> which probably would be, they said is we had two students apply. And I'm wondering if we could have a motion to apply and hopefully I'm not going to say this name wrong. I learned to it. So Jolanda Benson, who's at U32, a 10th grader, and Gwen, am I saying that right? Gwen Bear, a 7th grader at U32. Could I have a motion? I move to appoint Yolanda Bansa and Gwen Bear to the superintendent screening and interview committee. Thank you, Jonas. A second? I'll second it. Thank you, Lindy. Any questions or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. And then moving right along, uh, for central office, we had one, uh, I'm just gonna go in a little bit, just to, we have more applicants for parents and more applicants for faculty. So I'm gonna leave those towards the end so that we can get uh, going. So for central office, we had one applicant and that was uh, Michelle. So could I have a motion? 
I'll move to appoint Michelle Septa to the uh, superintendent steering and interview screening and interview committee. Thank you. Jonas. I'll, I'll second it. If, if Chris second. Oh, I'm sorry, Lindy can have it. Or Lindy can have well, okay. Come on, Lindy. I don't wanna, I don't wanna conf confuse Lisa. So I let her, Lisa, what, did you already have Chris? What do you have? Yeah, so uh, Jonas and then Chris second it. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, we have a very cute visitor with us that is so adorable. Uh, now let's move into, uh, and we already, the interim superintendent is part of it. We had already appointed the three board members, so we don't need to do that again. Uh, but I'm looking for other board members to, it might be worth it to just do it again, to just make it all official. So could I have a motion to appoint uh, Jen? I'll move to appoint Jen Miller Arsenault as interim superintendent to the uh, superintendent screening and interview committee. Second. Jonas, Ursula, any questions, any comments? Seeing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. And then the three board members that we had appointed before were Ursula, Maggie, and myself. Could I have a motion to that? Unless the board's pleasure is different now. Move to appoint um, Ursula, Maggie, and four um, as board representatives on the uh, superintendent screening and interview committee. Thank you, Chris. A, a second to that? I'll second. Thank you, Lindy. Any discussion? Uh, I had really hoped to participate in this. I didn't know that when uh, oh. uh, Maggie and Ursula were uh, uh, doing that initial work that that constituted uh, appointment to the committee. Neither did I. And Jonas, if you want my slot, you are welcome to it. Terrific. Thank you, Maggie. Okay. <laughs> so that was my I'll understanding mend, as well. I'll my motion to substitute Jonas for Maggie. Okay, Ursula, you're okay staying? Yeah, okay. Is the board okay with that? Yes. Okay, so all those in favor with the motion with the friendly amendment, Jonas, Ursula, and myself would be in the committee. Please say aye. 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 Right, any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Um, Okay, I think I'm done with all the easy ones. Okay, so for for the leadership team, uh, which is, uh, we had one applicant uh, to start and that was Gillian from, from Worcester, from the Doty School. And I also heard tonight from Lisa from U32. So if uh, yeah, she did not fill out the, the application this afternoon, uh, as I talked to Jen it, this afternoon, I, I think part of the reason that you're seeing that is that you know people are really burdened and there's just a lot going on, but she has expressed her willing uh, to, to serve because I think it would be important to have both the elementary and high school representation. So if the board is okay with that, could I have a motion to appoint uh, both Gillian and Lisa to to the I committee. Move, I move that we appoint Gillian and Lisa to the superintendent search and screening committee. Second. Second. Okay, Chris <laughs> and uh, Maggie. Sorry, guys. I'm trying to. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion carries. Okay, we're hey, doing... that, that's Lisa LaPlante, right? Just for just oh, sorry. Clear. Yes, yes, yes. Lisa okay. LaPlante. I'm just assuming you're yeah. 32. Sorry. Yes, Lisa LaPlante. And, um... <laughs> not, not Lisa Stout. Not you, Lisa. <laughs> Surprise, Lisa. <laughs> and uh, so, okay, let's, let's do faculty and staff trying to decide what would be saying. So for faculty and staff, if you have your little, I have so many open windows here. 
We have uh, Ellen Dorsey. Uh, we have, uh, uh, let's see, Daniel Dittlemeyer from Romney Elementary, sixth grade teacher. And please correct me if I'm wrong on this one. Uh, Elizabeth Mark from U32 and Drew Jenkins from U32. And we have one more. Jessica Hines. Jessica, yes. Jessica Hines from, uh, uh, from Berlin. So this one is gonna be a tough one, right? We have a lot of great uh, people applying. So this one would be one that we could use those four things that we were talking about to see, uh, to try to do it more proportional for uh, Yes, so, as from, a, I'm sorry, I'll stop. There are people with their hands up. Okay, uh, let me call into Maggie was first and then Stephen Luke. Yes, could you please repeat the towns because these weren't, in, some of these applicants didn't include it in their forms and I missed where um, Ms. Marks works. Could you just repeat all the towns again? Of employment, yeah, yeah, and, employment? yeah, yeah, and the school. Okay, so Jessica Hines works at Berlin and is also part of a leadership at the association. Uh, Daniel Dettelmeyer uh, works at Romney, sixth grade teacher. Uh, Elizabeth Mark uh, works at U32. And Drew Junkings works at U32. Titles? What, what are their roles? So, uh, Jen, you're going to have to help me here. Drew uh, teaches uh, math. And remind uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth is, uh, world language and global sit are her specialties. And Ellen Ms. Dorsey, instructional coach at the district level. Yeah. Can you repeat that? Because there was static, and I'm sorry, I know this is a lot to ask you to, to do, but it would be helpful. Yeah, no, it's it's okay. So, uh, who did you miss? So, Elizabeth teaches social studies and language. Uh, at, at U32. And Drew teaches math at U32. Ellen Dorsey is, is a coach and math specialist for basically for all our schools. And uh, who else did you miss? Jessica Hines, Berlin, Daniel Dittlemeyer, Romney. And most important, you know, read what they wrote in that, <laughs> in their little essay, right? And looking at you know that equity lens, uh, I'm gonna open it up now, Maggie. Now that you got that information, to Stephen and then to Diane. So I'd say to discuss this in open meeting is fraught with risk, and is going to um, restrict a frank discussion. So I would advocate that this not be done in an open meeting. Okay. Any this other board members agree? I, I was trying to do it all in the open, <laughs> right? So that people, but I'm, I'm okay with that too. Diane, what was, do you have a question before we? Well, I just, as a Berlin resident, um, I want to be sure that there is that opportunity that we consider all of the towns to be represented in some facet of the process. Okay. Jonathan, sorry, I can't really understand what you said. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with what Diane just said as well. Okay. So then, can, can we get so can we then get the um, the towns uh, where the parents are um, are from the parent sure. applicants because we've put Gillian from Worcester. Yeah. On the on the Gillian, committee. Gillian, Gillian actually lives in Middlesex now. Yes. But she's That's, but, but she's yeah. We will still claim her for Worcester there, Chris. Okay. So for for parents, just so that you can put notes to the side and then we'll go back to this. Is it, Shani is from Worcester. Natasha is from Worcester. Uh, Lauren Clements is from East Montpelier. Kathy Sutton is from Romney. 
and Danielle Lane is from East Montpelier. And again, when, when I wrote the, you know, consider town representation too, it's just to, to the extent possible, right? Not over other uh, qualities either. So um, I, I don't think if, if people wanna move into an executive session, I'm, I'm happy to do that. I, I also feel like we're not talking about anything personal about it's it's just we want to be as collaborative as possible in this in this process and i'm i'm almost inclined to to make a recommendation that we uh, considering the letter that we got received today too that we that that we include uh, jessica hines for example who would be berlin be a teacher and and be a counselor too right and i'm, I'm looking at jen to correct me if i'm wrong into what she does and um and that would be elementary school, and then to and, and and then you know to to pick one of the teachers or Ellen, what one of the U thirty two or or Ellen Dorsey as a second um, as a second candidate. Yeah. And we're not doing it, you know. They, they, we're not like you know not appreciating one over the other, right? When once we get into being part of this committee, everybody is equal, right? No, there's so no. What's the rationale for taking one of the two U32 folks? What's the reasoning from behind that? Because then we would have a teacher where we, we would have a teacher that represents both what teacher for elementary and a teacher for high school, right? We have a right now we have Gillian for a elementary. Lisa would be high school too, right? But Gillian's a principal. I don't think she's. I wouldn't say she rep, is a teacher representative. No, 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 Gillian. What I mean, what I mean is more about uh, if it's at the principal, which type of stakeholder, if it's at the principal or at the, okay. uh, at, at which school. But. Or can I make a motion? Yeah. Uh, I move to appoint Jessica Hines uh, and uh, Elizabeth Marks uh, to the screening and interview committee. I second that. Thank you. Any discussion on that? Maggie, your hand is up. Yes. Uh, when we were discussing the numbers previously, I had asked about whether we could have an additional educator. Is that still a possibility than, rather than two to have three? I had, I had raised concern about having three board members and only two direct educators. Yeah, so so right right now the the motion that we that we passed you you saw the table that we sent is what we all agreed uh, what we all agreed on but uh, as as far as representation you know ac across yeah I don't I don't know what to tell you Maggie I think this is this is what we have right now this is what we had agreed on uh, and and I feel everybody is going to be well represented uh, Chris McBay um, I'm going to put it in a a pitch for Daniel. Um, just because he's appeared before the board on a number of different occasions um, and is not soft-spoken uh, and is someone who will say what's on his mind, which I think would be very helpful in the screening process. Um, so I'm going to put in a, um, a recommendation for Daniel uh, Dittlemeyer. Okay. So is that a friendly amendment? Um, yes, it is. I will accept it. Thank you. So I guess the only thing is that we would have then two elementary and no high school. Uh, no, I thought that Chris would, he would be substituting uh, Jessica. Oh, I see. Okay. So I, again, there's no Berlin, Berlin representative person, representation yeah. in there at all. And I'm not saying that it has to dominate, but I think we should have a voice from each community at least present. Yeah, and, and Jessica is also part of the association. So I think let's let's vote on the motion that we have on the table right now, uh, which Jonas, can you repeat it again? Which, okay, so we're just, I, I put a motion on the table so that we had something to vote on, something to discuss. Yeah. Um, so I will move again that we nominate, uh, to nominate Jessica Hines uh, and Elizabeth Marks. And I still second it. Okay. It was Scott that seconded it. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, nay. 
Any abstain? Abstain. abstain. So two, oh, three abstain. So I'm gonna do I'm gonna do hands uh, again, just so that I can see who were the yes uh, votes. Could you just raise your hand either by hand or by one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, Jonathan, you just okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. Wait, seven, is this the yes? Ten. Yes, the yes. Eight. Sorry. Okay, eight. Okay, we're we're okay. Okay, so the motion carries. Thank you. It, let's move down to parents, <laughs> which is also going to be hard. So for 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 parents, uh, do you want me to repeat them again? We have uh, Daniel Lane from East Montpelier, uh, Katie, because I was kind of, Katie. I said it right this time. Katie Sutton from Romney, uh, Lauren Clements from East Montpelier. Uh, Natasha from Worcester and Shani from Worcester. Uh, Shani did say, if you read her last part on her uh, on her application, that she would she was she was very clear that she will defer. Uh, she said that she will step back and support the board's appointment. Parents or community members represented marginalized communities, identities. If you have the opportunity. Many thanks. So, so I think since we have two from from Worcester, I'm I'm gonna uh, put Natasha above, uh, not above, but as a recommendation over over Chani because she's willing to step to the side. And then I don't know if you guys have another. Could I have a motion if somebody's brave enough? <laughs> I'll make that motion. I'll uh, move to nominate uh, Natasha Eckert Banning and Katie Sutton to the screening and interview committee. I second, second. that. Okay, got it, Maggie. You got it. Okay, Jonas and Maggie, that was you, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Any discussion on that? Uh, Lindy. I'll just take up the Diane side here. As I'm looking through the list, do we have an East Montpelier? I know Jessica lives there, but she's representing Berlin as the teacher there. So I'm just asking if I've missed something. I am in East Montpelier too. So, so a board member is okay. 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 I know this is not perfect, but we're doing the best we can with those outlines. I think we're taking everybody into consideration and just being really open about how we're doing it. So all those in favor, please say of appointing Natasha and Kathy, Katie, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Abstain. One abstain. The motion carries. So we, we have a committee of 13 now. It, Lisa, were you able to keep track of that? I was, but I, I didn't find anything in the board packet. Like I, I was just making guesses at the names and I'm not sure I got the, the spelling of the names right. So is there... Okay, yeah, Lisa, I'll, I'll I'll send you the packet that Floor sent us with all the okay. uh, the, the, the the names in it. Thank you, Jonas. Thank you, Jonas. And Lindy, if it gives you any comfort, there's only one Callis representative on this too. And you know, <laughs> thanks, thankful for Michelle choosing to to um, run to participate or offer to participate. There's two Maggie because Lisa's from Callis also. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's move right on because we are almost in need of a break and we haven't even finished with board operations. So let's it's just really community forum debrief and planning for January page 21. Okay.
So let's, I, I wanted to open this conversation by, you know, first thanking Maggie for sending this. Uh, a lot of the sources that, that uh, you share with us, uh, Maggie, we use them at, depending what the forum is and how we need to inform the community. But uh, let's start first by, uh, you know, by acknowledging that, like you were saying, there's uh, more need for our social media presence, uh, for sure. And Jen uh, sent an invitation. We have created this engagement, you know, community engagement uh, committee uh, that we would like to invite you to. And uh, Jen, you sent the email already to, to Maggie, right? So, yeah, so this actually in some ways seg segues to the next conversation when we check in about board goals, but there was that board goal related to community engagement um, and the forums and public comment. And so, we hadn't ever really finalized or officially adopted that particular goal. So I circulated it back out to the uh, subcommittee who had done that. That was uh, Stephen, Ursula, Michaela, and I included Maggie because Maggie has expressed a strong interest. So, um, so it, probably we can continue this conversation for uh, alongside that community engagement goal conversation. Um, they're, they're very similar. Okay, and then we we received uh, we received input from from the last community uh, in engagement about not going into small groups. We we had a uh, you know so we're definitely going to rethink how we do our next community engagement. Right now, we were scheduled to be on the fifth and on the twelfth, but uh, we we're, we're thinking that on the fifth, uh, the the Ber Berlin has made the request for having a potential hearing with the town of, uh, of Berlin. Uh, we were trying to not do that now, but they have a deadline of, of February. And we feel that the, the meeting on the 12th would be sufficient instead of having two budget meetings, it went next to the other. That was the recommendation from the, from the steering committee. Uh, Maggie, I see your hand up. Yeah, I, my read from Michael Duane's email was not that he didn't like small groups. It was the small number of community participants in relation to board members in those small groups. Am I, did I misread that? And did we receive any other complaints besides Michael's? No, no. So, so he no. wasn't complaining about small yeah. groups. He, we yes. did so he was complaining about li limited involvement from community members. No, we also, Lindy, I, I see you. Yeah, the group that Lindy, when I was in, I, for, I forget who the participant yeah. was, um, but she said, you know, it's intimidating to be, you know, the only person in these groups, um, you know, and she wished that there had been, you know, a lot more sort of expository information, you know, given to her before we asked her to participate in a conversation. Sort of ironically, she ended up giving us a whole lot of stuff and talked for a while, which I thought was really valuable. Um, but that would, you know, uh, that wasn't the only comment that we got about the s small groups. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. But we didn't get any new emails. It was just what we received at the. We we all heard that feedback at the at at the, at the meeting. So we're definitely going to put some of this back on the community engagement committee, Lindy. <coughs> We've heard it at each of the community forums that people are over overwhelmed by the amount of board and ad, administrators in a room with one or two people and being put on the spot feeling. So I really felt like the small groups needed to change. And I was hoping that the committee is looking at that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we, we heard that input loud and clear, yeah. It, is there a committee? <laughs> yeah, and it, we're, we're going to discuss it even more in the goal, but Jen, if you want to, let's move into the goals because I think that would clarify that question, Maggie. Okay. 3.8 school board goals update. I'm going to leave, I, I'm going to start with that one since the conversation is fresh and I'm going to let you lead that, Jen. <laughs> Okay. Sorry, sorry, but Floor, before you go on, can you clarify the dates you were? I I got lost on the dates. So January January fifth. Okay. 
it's our uh, it's we're gonna have a hearing with Berlin. Okay. About and, and, a, and a community forum or yeah it's a community forum but it's just about the town of berlin so it's not a community forum we're going to have our budget forum on the 12th okay thank you thank you yes. okay jen go ahead all right so i'm gonna start this and then ursula i might put you right on the spot because you led this uh, email strand but i had just reached out again to the group that had originally drafted the community engagement goal so stephen ursula McKaylin. I included Maggie as well, uh, because she's expressed some strong um, interest in this topic and just suggested that now that we've had a few community engagement forums under our belt, that we um, look at re-examine the goal and see if it needs to be revised or tweaked before it gets officially adopted. That's when the idea of forming a committee um, around community engagement came up. And, um, and Ursula, if you wanna expand a little bit more, I think it would be great for the board to hear from you. Do you want me to expand on my ideas or just did we wanna discuss the um, community, community engagement goal that exists now also? So I think that the idea of, um, let me back up. I'm going to offer I'm going to offer you my perspective about the community forums. We've heard some of the same feedback before, um, and it is um, getting them together is a is a lot of work. And so, both in terms of substance and process. And so, I think that if there is a group that wanted to take on some more of that outreach and process piece to support public engagement. I think that would enrich the um, the, com the, sub the community forum. Hopefully we get more people there and um, there'd be a reciprocity there that was valuable to the board and valuable to the community. So um, overall, I think there's a, a desire to think about how to, how to create community engagement um, opportunities that are actually engaging the community. And one idea would be to have a committee that's a little bit more devoted to thinking about that and doing some of the behind the scenes work. Does that set you up, Ursula, to talk about it? I think so. I think so. In my emails, I have suggested um, either revising or adding on to the community um, goal, the community engagement goal, to include having a committee that could look into different methods of meeting the community, outreach to the community, using social media, um, different ways to kind of advertise what we're doing and share information about what we're doing to get their involvement. They may not have the time to come to the meetings. Um, in addition to people having commented on the small group work in the meetings, we've heard over a couple of meetings that people get a lot of information at those meetings, right? We give a, there's a presentation, they get a lot of information given to them and then they're put into a small group and they don't feel they have the time to process the information they've been given and then give comments that they've been able to think. They haven't had enough time to think about it. And so they're not getting the information ahead of time. So yeah, I guess I kind of feel that we could have a community engagement committee. It would look into different ways to share that information before we have our meetings, if we, you know, and thoughtfully have forums and try to drum up. Thank you, Ursula. People. So Maggie, yes, you are in that committee and I'm gonna pass this on to, to the committee to work on and redefine that goal and to create a calendar and to you know, just really figure out what's the best way to put the information out. Uh, we, we still have our whole finance part, so I'm not trying to not say that this is not important, but I, I really want us to work on the budget today too. And uh, Stephen. As a member of that committee, um, it would be, useful in my mind if we got some specific guidance from the board. I know when we had met earlier, everyone had a different perspective on what we're talking about with community engagement. And if it's specific to community forums, then I understand that and I know how to work. If it's improving community engagement, then it's a real shotgun discussion and could go in any direction. So 
I would hope that there could be some level of specificity on what specifically to address, at least to prioritize what gets addressed first and then second and so on. So I think what we've been hearing from community members and from board members, it would be, it would be helpful to have a communications calendar when things are gonna be put out. So to be on top of, uh, of communicating. So you, your committee will be in charge of trying to spread the word, right? in partnership uh, with other organizations that are trying to help us. But uh, that would be one uh, to me from what I was hearing from, from the different reports. And, and then the, the second one was to make what uh, Jen was sharing to make uh, help us make our community engagement, uh, engagement uh, meetings more engaging, right? So participate as much or as little is more important that we have the information out right now in different mediums to different people and the people are getting uh, the information that they need and they feel more included. That, that would be to me, priority one. Priority two would be, you know, that you guys engage also in the content and help us put the forums together. Is that clear or more confusing, Stephen? So you want us to work on the uh, community forums? Uh, yes. Yeah, and okay. both. That's clear. Okay. So let's move on into the other two goals. Just a quick report out from, because uh, they were there for you to see. Uh, Kari, do you want to do quality and then? Sure. Yeah, the Ed Quality Committee met um, earlier tonight, and we are going to bring a recommendation for one. Um, additional board goal this year, which would be to complete our student learning outcome review for new folks. You, you wouldn't necessarily know that um, we spent a good portion of 2020 and early 21 going through each of our student learning outcomes and talking specifically about how a little bit about how the instruction is um, organized and delivered and what some of the outcomes are like. Um, so we want to complete that process. Uh, it'll include um, monthly reports, basically, and um, some of the um, some of the data that we have. So we'll be bringing that to you next month, and um, that will take us through the end of the school year. Thank you, Carrie. And the the finance committee also met, and our long term uh, goal was the, uh, the capital improvement plan. Uh, we've been working with the the spreadsheet from Blackboard Design that they created for different projects, and more, so we're trying to. Chris O'Brien is here too, so he can he can speak of uh, to it. But we we work in this room to making sure that we're taking care of our schools and all. And as you all know, the building environment is a big factor in improving educational outcomes too and being proactive not reactive and planning ahead and being prudent with our resources so if you read the you know i don't gonna i'm not gonna go into all the measurable and what we wrote there but it's basically to start with the five year and move on into the 25 year but just make sure that we're investing in our buildings and taking care of our assets um, and i'm gonna move on into board meeting a location and platform on page 20, oh, sorry, staff appreciation first. Uh, Diane, do you wanna lead us on this? But Just, yes, just a quick update. We are quickly, um, as you had mentioned, Floor got a chance to visit at um, Calis today. Um, I was finally gonna make it to Berlin, but then that, that didn't work out for that schedule. So we also have some elves in the, the works to deliver some goodies to all the buildings. So just a real great appreciation for the hard work that is happening. It is a very stressful year for all and for the community and our families. So just great appreciation for that. And Lindy, I think you were going to mention something as well. Only if I can get unmuted, it wouldn't seem to unmute. Um, I just, I wanted to say how much, um, even though my inbox seems to be jammed packed constantly, I really enjoy getting the emails from the principals with their community letters each week because it gives us a peek inside each of the schools. And um, 
there's ice on the playground that makes things a little hazardous, you know, things like that. It's, you can picture in your head, those kids running out to go to recess and off we go. Um, Or they're thankful for the little elves that are dropping things off and they're thanking people. Just, it really gives us a little um, view. And right now not being able to be in the schools, I'm sure the community members enjoy that as well. So um, it's, I, I just think it's really nice that we get that and we get a little taste of it. I happen to get the East Montpelier PTO one through Facebook. I guess I liked it or something. And um, there's another taste coming from the community and the community involvement. So as a board member, it's pretty nice, I think, to see those community letters and I hope parents are reading them and seeing them. Thank you, Lindy. Thank you, Diane. And thank you to all the staff that is here and that includes central office staff and bus drivers and kitchen staff, everybody. So thank you for all you do. A board meeting location and platform. On page 26, there was a quick memo. And as you know, we have been fielding some inquiries about, you know, about when we're going to move into in-person and if that made sense or not. And we, the steering committee, with help from Carrie, put out a, a memo out. And our, our thinking is with the COVID transmission, as it is currently, that we revisit this decision in March at our reorganizational meeting and for the time being, stay remote. Yeah. So we wanted to open up to the, you know, we don't want to make the decision for yourselves, but Lindy? Well, I think the numbers have been, you know, ridiculously high, 700s and things like that. Um, so I agree with that. I was wondering about the last sentence, if it had anything to do with this memo about winter sports oh, or well, athletics. Yeah, yeah, well, we wanted to include it because we, as you guys received a letter from, from Jen to, right, we have opened up our schools now for some of the winter sports. People are coming to our schools. So we want to recognize uh, uh, that, uh, that, you know, that's happening. That's what that sentence at the end is, is, is there for, in case you guys didn't know. Right, am I, Jen? Yes. <laughs> so uh, could I... I think we we should take a formal uh, motion on this, uh, just so that people know that that's what we're gonna do. Unless you guys think differently, but Kari. So I'll move that we continue to meet remotely um, until at least March. Second. Thank you. Kari moves. Jonas second. Any more discussion? Yeah, I, I have a. Um, I yeah. prefer the amendment to be more affirmative and say that we will reconsider in March when we reorganize as opposed to, so we have a, a, a definite goal of doing that when we reorganize as to whether or not we're going to continue to meet remotely or not. So make another decision rather than just let it go by. Oh, I, I think that's what Kari was saying, right? Yeah, I'll accept that friendly amendment. Okay. It's yeah, more, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kari. And I assume Jonas, you're okay with that too. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Hearing none, the motion carries. Okay, this, we already had the student reports. This is moving to the superintendent uh, report. I also wanna acknowledge that we've been sitting for a little, if people need a, two minute break, this would be a good time to have it. And then we would just move towards the end of the, the meeting quickly. So, yep. Yeah. Okay, let's, it's 1930, it's 734. Yep. Uh, let's come back in five minutes and then we be prepared to sit until <laughs> the end. Thank you. Okay, let's get started. Uh, with the superintendent report, I'm assuming everybody's going to start coming back into camera as we get going. Uh, do you want to move on, Jen, with the superintendent report, please? Yeah, sure. I'm just going to share a little bit of a COVID update with you. Maria is here as well. Um, I'll invite her to add anything that I forget or get wrong. 
A few key things to note. Um, first of all, last night we held a vaccination clinic at Doty. Um, huge thanks to Maria uh, for staffing it, for Nurse Jess from Doty and Gillian and I and uh, the folks from Shaw's were there. We had about 30 um, kids sign up and come mostly, uh, actually, I think when all was said and done, about half of them were first doses and about half of them were second. And the folks who came expressed um, deep appreciation for the opportunity to do it there. It was closer for them and more convenient. Um, I wanna share with you our vaccination rates. And I know one of my numbers is wrong. So uh, Maria or Kat, correct me, because I didn't have a chance to write it correctly. But right now, as of today, um, we have a, a vaccination rate of at U32 among our students of 83%. Doty, we have 43% with one dose. East Montpelier, 74% with one dose, 59% with two doses. Callis, 73% one dose, more than 27% is two doses. Kat or Maria, you want to shout out that number? We are at... 47%. Thank second you. dose. 47 second dose. Rumney is 58% one dose, 42% two doses. And Berlin is 53% one dose, 37% two doses. Um, this is important to note for a few reasons. Um, when we hit uh, 80%, um, then some of our practices can change in some of our buildings, um, including uh, what happens or doesn't happen around contact tracing and um, test to stay. It also um, means that in our elementary schools, we might be able to utilize our cafeterias in ways that are different than we're currently utilizing them for lunch. Um, I wanted to say one other thing about that, I forget. And then the... Uh, the other thing that I think is important to note is that um, we obviously just had a break around Thanksgiving time and we're entering a break as well. And we just are, uh, again, urging folks to remain vigilant, to um, follow all the mitigation strategies um, in the communities as well. As Maria will attest, um, it's not fun to call families and let them know that kids are close contacts and that that means that they might have to quarantine, which is thwarting some of their plans during some of those holidays or travel. So um, those have been some hard phone calls to have, I would say. Um, so I would just, I know we have a lot to do. If there are questions or comments, anything, I'm happy to entertain them right now and to um, pass on to Maria, anything as well. Scott and then Jonas. Thanks, Jen, um, and thank you, Flora. Uh, how do you um, how do you manage unvaccinated employees? Uh, are there special procedures for that? Um, just curious, please. So, um, in the memorandum of understanding that you um, signed or approved last time, there's a um, a a, a clause that says that if folks are unvaccinated staff members, that they will undergo weekly testing twice and report the results. And, um, and we as a labor management committee have recognized that there are things that we couldn't anticipate that will be coming up. And indeed, that is the case. So we're going to continue in good faith to just figure out some of the nuances to make sure that as folks have questions or concerns, we can answer them. But right now, the short answer is that we're requiring some more testing of unvaccinated folks. Um, we're still universally masking across the board in our schools, regardless of vaccination status. Thank you, Scott. Jonas and then Maggie. Uh, just really quick, I hope that the LMC uh, will consider uh, uh, looking at what the definition of vaccinated is uh, and to include a booster shot with the impending uh, Omicron wave. Thank you, Jonas. Uh, Maggie, you, your hand is down now, but do you yes, have a question? Yes, I okay. was being proactive. Um, I, this is, I think, a question for Maria mainly. Um, we've heard on numerous occasions now public comment where concern for 
um, negative of effects on kids from testing has been raised. And I'm wondering if you could speak briefly to, to any science um, around harm to children by engaging in this routine testing in our schools. I um, am not aware of any research on whether or not uh, testing causes children trauma. If my my first instinct was to actually be a little snarky about it, which was <laughs> children pick their nose all day, every day. And I really don't feel like this specific testing modality is stressful to children. Um, but the, the truth is, is that <clears throat> children, um, what I have noticed with the children when we do test to stay in school is that they have inherited... Um, rightfully so, the anxiety of their parents and the people around them regarding being positive for COVID. And so they are actually, um, they have expressed uh, gratitude for being able to feel safe in school. So the, the, we learned a couple of things when we did test to stay. We did learn, we first started um, by actually doing the test at the student desk and leaving the test on their desk so that we knew whose test was whose. And what we found was when we left the test in front of the children, this was only the first testing that we did, the first classroom we did, that the kids were very anxious about it. They didn't like looking at it. It made them uncomfortable. They weren't sure when it was supposed to be, you know, they, they just couldn't focus on anything else with the test in front of them. So we started testing them and then keeping the tests behind them. Um, and doing the testing behind them so nobody could see. And it was incredible how quickly it switched into children went right back into the routine of the classroom and never really thought about it again. Um, and we were able as the people who did the testing to then put the tests on a cart, walk out of the classroom after half an hour and the kids didn't notice anything else, but they did feel um, a little bit safer and that we were taking steps to making sure that they were safe in school. I have not read anything about the modality of this simple nasal swab causing any more trauma than the collective anxiety and fear of our um, general population over the last two years. Um, so I'm not really sure what I can do to reassure anybody. Um, I feel like people's opinions are pretty hard held these days. Um, but children are incredibly resilient. We have watched that over and over again throughout this pandemic. Um, and they have seemed to accept this uh, daily testing if they've been exposed just as easily as they've accepted any other changes we've implemented throughout the school year. So I have not witnessed any children being overly traumatized um, by this. Um, and in fact, they kind of welcome it as an interesting um, break up to their normal school day, if you know what I mean. Thank you, Maria. Uh, Jonas? Uh, thanks, Floor. Um, I, Maria, I can shed some light on that. Um, one of the current uh, pieces of pandemic-related mis- and disinformation that's flying around uh, is that nasal swab tests somehow endanger the blood-brain barrier, uh, which is not true because to uh, affect the blood-brain barrier with a nasal swab, you would have to drill through bone. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm thinking how you could possibly do that with a Q-tip. Uh, so, and I want to thank Maggie for for bringing this up at this part of the meeting. Uh, Maria, I wonder if you could also tell us why masks are safe. Certainly. Could you tell us, um, could you make, just make sure that people know that masks don't cause a buildup of CO2, a certainly. dangerous CO2, right? And all of the other sort of disinformation that's out there. A hundred percent. There is a lot of misinformation, disinformation, however we want to call it. I will say that um, as far as I'm concerned and as far as most people in the research world is concerned, um, the debate about masks is over and it's been over for over two years now. Um, and th the truth of the matter is, if you look around the world, right, one of the things that the pandemic does has, has sort of allowed us to look um, on a greater global scale, uh, Asia, people in Asian cities have been wearing masks for 10 to 15 years now. Um, there has never been any sort of research that states that there is any sort of, um, that there is any long-term uh, negative effects from wearing a mask for the periods of time that you are within a group. 
Nobody is wearing a mask for 100% of their day. Nobody is not getting a break. And none of the masks that anybody is wearing in the civilian world actually block out enough oxygen to create any sort of loss of oxygen and build up in CO2 in their bodies. Now, um, having worked in hospitals for 15 years before I came into the school, I can promise you that wearing an N95 for extended periods of time is a very uncomfortable and miserable experience. No one in the civilian world has a hold of medical grade N95 masks and is wearing them for 12 plus hours at a time. Um, so there is no true documentation that um, there's any sort of CO2 buildup. There's no brain damage that's occurring. There's no loss of oxygen. The truth is, is if the, your oxygen level is low enough to begin with that wearing a mask would cause you harm, you should not be out in public in the middle of a global pandemic regardless, because your health is not um, good enough to be subjected to potentially exposing yourself to this virus. Um, the, the mask debate, like I said, is over. I refuse to have it with anybody anymore because there's just no point. The research is sound. Um, and and to, to at this point, to say that we're gonna go against the WHO and the CDC and the AAP and everybody else, as far as I'm concerned, translates into a demographic that I'm, that, that you can't have a, a serious scientific conversation with. Does that make sense? Um, the, the, there isn't anything that has come forth that has shown that masks in short periods of time can be anything but beneficial in um, stopping viral transmission. We know that we've had a much lower influenza rate over the last couple of years. Um, and we know that we had a much lower RSV rate over the last couple of years. And um, I think that it's been pretty clear that we have um, slowed the viral transmission of COVID-19 um, pretty dramatically with the use of masks in, a regular, um, in regular usage. Um, so that's sort of my answer is that I feel like the science on that is sound and there's really very little to debate any longer. I don't know if that really answers your question. Jonas. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Maria. I don't mean to rush you. That's just, okay. I know I'm long-winded. Thank you. Yeah, because we have a couple of other questions. Yes. So, Michaela. Um, hi. Sorry, I just wanted to. Um, <clears throat> I have to weigh in as a family physician that I completely agree that the science is very clear here that masks are helpful in preventing transmission of COVID and do not pose a threat. Um, physiologically. There was a study in JAMA Pediatrics in June, but it was retracted. It was a terrible study, and there have subsequently been studies that it's totally safe. Um, and yeah, thank you. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And no risks to the nasal swab. I agree with that. Right. As well. Thank you, doctor. Yeah. Chris? Uh, Maria? Is Chris, there, Chris, is, yeah. yeah, is there a, um, a study that can you lay your hands on that would just reiterate what you just said about the masks? And, and maybe we could post that on our website because um, there are still folks out there who have misconceptions uh, and it would be good just to have a, a, the paper that folks turn to and say, this is it, just so they can educate themselves. Um, because I think you're right that the, uh, the debate has hardened uh, and folks may not want to be educated or or be open to it, but it would be good, I think, to have it on our website. Some type of medical scientific scientific paper that we sure. what you just said. Um, I can look into trying to find something that uh, would work. What I find is the minute you present research, people find an opposing right. bit of research. And it's very, very difficult to say, but my research is peer reviewed and yours is a YouTube video. <laughs> and um, that becomes a really difficult argument to have, but I'm more than happy to try to find something that could be for the most part irrefutable in terms of at least being a good peer reviewed, uh, you know, sound piece of science that we can put on the website. I appreciate that. Thank, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Maria. And thank you, Chris. Hey, Anna has a question. I just wanted to comment on the idea that the 
you know, the masking and the testing is um, endangering the students. Um, I, as a student at U32, I get a COVID test every single Monday. I wear a mask every single day at school. And it's honestly, you know, quite relieving and protecting to be able to have that routine and to come in on a Monday and say, okay, have I been out in the world? Do I feel at all sick? I can take this COVID test and not have to worry about that. And if it is a positive, we have a really good program to be able to, you know, quarantine and feel safe and be able to still do schoolwork. So I find the the test itself, it's very simple. It's, you know, an inch up the nose. They're very sweet about how it goes. And I feel very, very safe in the school taking the test and getting my results. And it's very clear. Thank you so much, Anna, for sharing so clearly. Um, okay. It, anything else, Jen or Maria, um, for now? Okay, so I, I'm, I'm going to, I had added 4.3. We are without a lot of time, but I was just going to say for the Career Center, it's uh, just a little celebration or delight is the way of the day today, but we went in front of the State Board of Education today and they approved the change of governance for the Career Center. So it's going to be voted in March. So we would need everybody's help to have this be a positive vote. So I think you should celebrate too. So the career center now would be its own district basically, which is really exciting. Moving on to the finance committee. Suzanne, I'm gonna let you do a little bit of the of the monthly reflection just because we we love we love that part. And I'm gonna start just by thanking everybody, including you, Suzanne, for all the work with what we're about to review. Yeah, right now. So take it away. Sure. Uh, so the monthly reflection this month, uh, I wanted to talk about the allowable tuition report that Matt focuses on. Uh, we actually had two that we had to reconcile this year because the AOE sent FY20 this fall as well as FY21. Normally that's done every November. It was delayed. Uh, the monthly grant reimbursement uh, is on the 15th and Matt's also responsible for that. The special ed expenditure report uh, for October 31st is due November 15th, and Renee is a huge help with that, so I want to make sure she gets a big shout out. Thank you. Uh, the AOE teacher staff survey is an annual report due December 1st that Carla is responsible for. Uh, and I also uh, give a shout out to everyone in the report for their work on the budget. It takes a lot of different puzzle pieces to put this together and everyone has a hand in it at, at some point or other. Um, the annual audit report that RHR Smith and Company uh, is included in your packet tonight and Matt um, helped to reconcile that report and the deadline to return open enrollment documents uh, to Virginia was November 19th and Virginia has done uh, a huge amount of work for open enrollment. And I'm sure that everyone's very familiar with the efforts that HR departments put together when, when you get your open enrollment packets. And uh, Virginia has been working really hard to make that a really nice smooth transition and have everybody enrolled and up and running with uh, cards and accounts January 1st. So thank you to Virginia for all her work. Thank you, Suzanne. The other two pieces are informational. Are there any questions on the energy project consultant net mirroring or the allowable tuition for year 2021? No, so seeing none, let's move into the action part of the finance committee. It, could I have a motion for the out to floor scrubber lease that Chris McVeigh can write? It, Scott. <laughs> Especially designed for this purpose. Yes. I, I move that the board authorize the superintendent to sign a 36-month lease agreement for $1,038.19 per month, plus a $150 one-time document fee for two Trident ride-on auto scrubbers and one Trident walk behind auto scrubber with the option to purchase the equipment for $1 at the end of the lease. Thank you, Scott. Hey, can I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ursula. Any questions, Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Any oppose? Any abstain? Hear none, the motion carries. Um, the audit report on, on page 32, could I have a motion? Uh, potentially Carrie or Scott? I'll move that we accept the audit report. I second. Thank you. Any discussion? Go ahead, Scott. Um, just to point out to um, members of the board and everybody else listening um, who might not have had the chance to comb through it in detail, it's actually a really good audit report. Um, so we're, we're in, in very decent shape here on the financial side, which is extremely nice. Scott, do you have one or two points that could illustrate that? Or Suzanne, do you have one or two points that could illustrate that? Yeah. Suzanne, Suzanne, go 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 ahead and then uh, I, I was have just my gonna, own favorites too. I was just gonna direct everyone to page 148 of the packet, which is 106 of the audit report. And Kari in the meeting made a, a really good question about um the summary of the it's the summary of the auditor's results, and he wanted to know about the type A and type B in the middle there. And I did find out that uh, the federal award grantees are audited as either type A or type B programs. Since our federal grant revenues last year were between seven hundred fifty thousand dollars and twenty five million, the school district is a type A, and so that is what that's indicating is we're type A as far as our federal grantee status. But I would also say about this audit report, um, it's really impressive the amount of extra money that came through the school district and, and no uh, increased staff in the finance department that the, um, the audit report is really clean and it speaks really loudly about the procedures and policies that are in place and how well uh, the finance department functioned as a team with Lori's leadership. It's, it's really impressive. And a lot of that money that Suzanne is talking about is federal money, which comes with all kinds of very strict requirements and, um, and uh, demands for accounting and making sure that everything is, is done just so. And, and that happened, which is, which is pretty great. Yeah, and Kari, I saw your hand up, yep. I just wanted to mention that um, for those who are new to looking at these reports, um, a very wise uh, seasoned board member told me to always go to the very end. And so if you look at page 103 and the last few pages, including 106 that Suzanne was just referring to, that's where it tells us that there were no findings and that, that, and that the reports that we're getting through the year are, are accurate. And so that is um, really important for us as a board to understand that um, the information we're getting is, is right on. So congratulations to Suzanne and the team. Yeah. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah, and thank you everybody. And I don't know if you noticed that first in the first uh, page where they write to us and they mentioned that the report was, uh, the information provided by our department was neutral, consistent and clear which is really great too. So thank you, Suzanne. And, and also thank you to Lori, because that was part of last year's too, and Matt and your team. So thanks everybody. Uh, let's move, uh, not, not move on. We have a, uh, a motion on the table. All those in favor, let me just go back to my note. Uh, we have a motion on the table to accept the report. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, Flora, so I think the note should say that we approved it with appreciation. That sounds great. Thank you, Diane. Okay. And just, uh, Lisa, do you have that? Uh, Carrie moved and Scott second. And so the motion carries. I didn't hear any no. Let's uh, now finally almost getting to it. So the draft budget. 
should we get started? <laughs> okay, Jen and Suzanne, you're on. All right. So in your packet on page 149 is a memo that Suzanne and I wrote um, outlining the changes in draft two and 2A. And to supplement that memo um, and support our conversation, we've created a presentation. So Mark, if you can pull up the presentation, we can get started. All right, so again, we're presenting to you um, Draft two and draft two A. Oh, Mark, we just lost it again. Okay, and you can go to present and go to the next slide. Sorry, I get in there. Uh, it's just uh, not quite cooperating here. No worries. Great, thank you. And now you can go to the next slide. Thanks. So again, um, we want to keep our mission statement uh, at the front, you know, front and foremost in our minds as we engage in this process, knowing that the budget needs to reflect our community's values, our mission statement, and student needs. Next slide, please. A reminder to you all and um, our community members that you establish parameters for the leadership team to be considering. And here they are. Before I want to just underscore too, um, we hope that you're going to see a commitment in draft two and especially 2A in, uh, in meeting our students and staff's needs around the social emotional pillar and that you'll see an emphasis on the multi-layered system of supports, knowing that in this district, there are perpetual differences in performance between student groups, um, particularly students who qualify for free and reduced lunch and students who don't, and students who are on individualized education plans and students who are not. Next slide, please. And a reminder to you all and to the community at large that we have been seeking some feedback from the community over these many months um, from the staff through a survey and the leadership team has been working. So the common theme across all of that is um, care for our students and for our staff, for our community and our buildings. And then in the left hand column again, all three of those groups identified these things that are bulleted as priorities. Again, hoping that you're going to see some uh, parallels to what we present. And then two of the three groups um, articulated a priority of the things on the right hand side. Next slide. So um, we want to present to you um, some of the, the big things here. So um, the in, in draft number two, you're going to see a commitment to cybersecurity and hardening. And, um, and this is in uh, page 150, is that right? Or 151 of your board packet. Um, you're going to see that we're allocating about $114,000 for um, cybersecurity hardening uh, software and equipment replacement. We're all allocating about $94,000 um, to meet the needs in part because there was some deferred replacement of voting equipment last year, and we have some needs right now. Um, we are increasing transportation in draft two based on the transportation bid that was just awarded. Uh, this current draft reflects the salary and benefits as they currently exist, including the um, horizontal movement signups that were due earlier this month. We have done our best to um, anticipate all of our needs for special education and reflect those in this draft. We also, given what we know about Act 173 and special education funding, we're including those updates to revenues and we are using grant funds when they are available. Um, transportation's up about $25,000-ish and the negotiated items for salary and benefits um, yield a result, uh, result in an increase of about $849,000. Next slide. This is where Suzanne's gonna take over for a bit. 
Uh, expenditures are the amount the district plans to spend. Revenues are the money the district anticipates receiving to offset the expenditures. And the net education spending is the amount that needs to be raised by property taxes. On page 151 of your packets, I also provided the net budget increase for both drafts of the budget. Because this is the percentage the district has previously used as net impact on taxes. The dollar amount of the increase is the same for both calculations, but the percentage calculation differs. The percentage calculation in the net budget increase is a comparison of the increase to the prior year's expenditure budget of $34,984,949. This percentage, uh, the percentage difference of 3.77%, uh, oops, lost my place. <laughs> this percentage calculation um, increase is 3% for budget draft number two. The percentage calculation used for the increase in net education spending is a comparison of the increase to the prior year's net education spending of $27,792,291. This percentage increase is 3.77% for budget draft number two. Going forward, I recommend the district utilize the percentage change in net education spending as the measurement of growth year over year. This is in line with the percentage used by the tax commissioner to measure education spending growth and set the property yield for the next fiscal year. If you see the tax commissioner's December 1 letter in the packet, page 165, um, you'll note that. Now back to page 153 in the packet, uh, there's a comparative budget summary that gives you a breakdown of the changes in the budget by category. In order to get this budget below a 3% increase in net education spending, expenditures must be reduced by $214,898, or the school board could authorize the use of fund balance to lower the tax impact. Next slide, please. All right, so we've also presented to you draft 2A, and I'm gonna do a quick rundown and summary, and then I'm gonna invite leadership team colleagues to supplement what I've said in more details. So. Um, draft 2A includes everything that was included in, two, in draft two, and it increases a social studies teacher at U32 at 0.6 FTE to allow more flexibility and more opportunity for students to achieve proficiency in the global citizenship standards. It includes an increase um, in music from um, of 0.1 so that um, we can have music, uh, it would increase the callous music teacher from 0.3 to 0.4. That makes the total music position a 1.0 FTE position and allows people to be in one building all day rather than having to travel midday. You know that we have increased enrollment in East Montpelier Elementary School. It's our only school right now where the enrollment numbers are increasing. And to be in um, adherence to our class size policy and to best meet our students' needs, we're uh, proposing that we increase FTEs by 2.0 for classroom teachers. We believe that one of those positions would be a one-time um, one-time expenditure. So we're proposing that we offset. 1.0 FTEs by using fund balance for that one year request. Because we are anticipating going from 10 classrooms to 12 at East Montpelier, we need to increase the music, we're proposing increasing the music teacher at East Montpelier at 0.2. We have some unmet needs um, just even around just generally supporting students. Um, at Doty, we're a little understaffed and to ease that burden and ensure that we're supervising students and meeting their needs more generally, we're increasing that, we're and, uh, suggesting a part-time increase of the Doty school-wide paraeducator. We have a continued need for more literacy intervention at Callis. And again, we're um, anticipating using ARP ESSER funds to increase that by 0.5. And then at U32, we're, uh, we have the need for uh, restorative um, in-school 
experienced interventionist to support students academically and socially so that they can more fully in, uh, engage in and access their classes, um, so similar to the Spark Center at the middle school. I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna invite uh, my leadership team colleagues, if there's anything that I said too quickly or details that I missed, will you please speak up? I can't see you all, so just go for it. All right. And I think you captured it. Okay, thanks, Alicia. Thank you, next slide. So I would direct you to the net education spending down at the bottom of this chart. Uh, the percentage increase is 4.38% for budget draft 2A. On page 154 in the packet, there's a comparative budget summary that gives you a breakdown of the requested new or expanded services and the proposed offsetting revenues. In order to get this budget below a 3% increase in net education spending, the expenditures must be reduced by $384,623, or the school board could authorize the use of unbalanced to lower the tax impact. Next slide, please. The equalized homestead tax rate is the rate a district would have if all properties were assessed at fair market value. The common level of appraisal is the ratio of each town's listed values versus the state's listed value. The state's listed value is comprised of actual sales, generally averaged over three years. The state's fair market value is the equalized education grant list. The higher the CLA in column two, the lower the tax rate. The estimated tax rates in the education tax rates seen on a property tax bill of a resident homeowner in the individual towns, where they are. The district's equalized pupils, town CLAs, and the state's final property yield per $1 tax rate will all likely change before we finalize this. The Washington Central equalized pupils are expected, they were expected today, I still have not seen them, I'm hoping tomorrow. <clears throat> the local CLA used to calculate the estimated tax rates for each town should be known in January. They generally come out around December 31st. The current tax rate calculation uses the most conservative approach from the tax commissioner's December 1 letter, assuming the legislature will not apply any of the anticipated balance in the Ed Fund to reduce the tax rate. The final figures will be set by the legislature during the legislative session and approved by the governor. Next slide, please. So this is the same chart, only using budget draft 2A. You'll note that both budget draft 2 and 2A result in across the board de decreases in the estimated tax rates due to the increase in the property yield provided by the tax commissioner. We'll let you digest a little bit on this slide and find your applicable town. Next slide, please. So we also wanted to be really open and transparent about what is not included in draft two or 2A right now. So I wanna talk through these a little bit. Right now, the Equity Scholar in Residence program is not included in either of these drafts. If you recall, in recent years, we had a grant that supported the Equity Scholar in Residence at U32. Last year, the board authorized the use of fund balance to pay for the Equity Scholar in Residence in full and at a, at a district level. So that's happening this year. It's amazing. It was a fund balance um, expenditure and it has not made it into either of the drafts yet. And to be completely honest with you, when we level, when we presented you the level service budget, I, I missed that. So I just wanna be fully transparent about that. Um, we have a conversation in the works about um, down the line building our capacity so that um, we're able to, um, to be self-sufficient self and sustaining. And right now that is not in the budget. Um, there is in the budget 
the um, the debt service that is finished at U32, 155,000 is included in the budget toward the um, capital expenditures. There are a few other uh, reductions in debt service that are about $25,000. And right now um, they are not included in draft two or two A. There is an additional foods, um, food service staff member that is not included. Again, I'm gonna invite my colleagues to speak a little bit more about some of these things and we'll hear more about that in just a little bit. As you heard earlier in public comment right now in the, in the budget, um, Berlin Art is staffed at 0.5 FTE and Callis is staffed at 0.3, which is the current level right now. That's currently 0.8 and there's not an increase in the draft. Um, special education at Berlin, we're recognizing that, um, that things are getting tight. And we're also thinking about ways that we might be able to meet um, needs of students across the schools, uh, maybe slightly differently than we have. There's not an additional 1.0 for Berlin in there. For um, information tech and support, we had talked about that possibility. There's a big effort in this budget for hardening and cybersecurity. It does not include additional um, network support. We're still trying to ascertain what we really need. This has been a an hugely unusual year and um, with lots of things happening on both um, um, with staff members and with uh, the cybersecurity breach and with uh, software in general. So it's, it's just hard to know. And then we've talked about in the long term, really wanting to look at pre-kindergarten, thinking about how we might expand pre-K across the board. We'd want to really look at being able to do that across all five of our towns. And so we can't even, we really haven't even spent the time to fully cost it out. That would be a big project and we haven't done that yet. I'm gonna pause and invite uh, again, leadership team members to speak up um, in more detail to some of what is not in draft two or two A. Jen, I can speak quickly to the additional staff and food service, just so the board knows. We, this would only be necessary if the federal government or the state government decides to make universal food um, to all of our students. Um, and it would also be contingent upon whether or not we needed uh, or we were actually making this revenue up. So we wouldn't be wanting to do this if we weren't in going to be able to get revenue in the uh, program to cover it. And so this is why it's not something that we're requesting right now, but just something to be aware of that we might need should this, because um, we have an open position right now at U32 and helping do food service. Thanks, Stephen. Anyone else want to share more details? It's Aaron here. I just want to reiterate um, regarding the art position for Berlin and Callis. Um, <clears throat> we know that last year we had some uh, um, a lot of discussion around the arts, and uh, this would help us bring things back to center a bit. Um, so, yes, we know that it's in the category of not included, um, but uh, Kat and I have talked a lot about. Um, what really feels like is needed for for both our schools to have a, um, a a high quality art program we think this would be helpful thanks Aaron. anyone else i'd just like to echo what Aaron just said thank you for speaking up Aaron. and i think as you heard in public comments earlier this evening um from Erica when she spoke to this. She shared that she had the support of both of the administrators of Aaron and I, and that is the case. Thank you. All right, next slide. Um, also, in an effort to be fully open and transparent, we wanna share with you that there are some non-budgetary changes that are included in, in the way that we're thinking about allocating resources. So there's a, um, the Rumney PE position would decrease um, by 0.1 and the Doty PE position would increase 2.1. It uh, does not end, uh, it, the end result is that students are still getting the PE that they are currently getting. What this allows is a staff member to be in a building for a full day without having to um, tra travel in the middle of the day. 
and it allows uh, Dodi, which is really um, quite taxed by having such limited uh, specialists and staff in the first place, to have a little bit more flexibility to meet needs. So yes, Rumney would miss that point one, and it would not uh, have a direct impact on students in terms of any anything less than they are currently getting. We also, Rumney Art would, in this proposed budget, decreases from 0.5 to 0.4. East Montpelier Art increases, um, but from 0.5 to 0.6. Again, that's currently a shared position. It remains 1.0. It allows people to be, the art teacher to be in buildings full days. Uh, it eliminates the need to travel in the middle of the day. All students have the same um, art access to art classes that they currently do. What this does, the impact that it might have at Rumney is there's a little bit of a sliver of FTE at Rumney for art integration. And that would be a little bit trickier. And the principals have already talked about that. And um, in terms of working together, should that need arise to figure out flexibly and creatively uh, how that might happen in order to continue to support art integration. And then the other thing that it's important to know is that we do our best to really analyze student needs and take into account incoming um, students who are in pre-K and shifting to kindergarten, students who are graduating from U32, and then students who are transitioning from sixth grade to seventh grade. Um, and we try really hard not to shift positions. And we generally don't unless it's making sense for, um, for kids but we won't know exact school assignments for quite a while, um, although we're anticipating the, the FTEs. And again, I wanna pause and invite my colleagues to, to say anything else that, um, that I've missed or that needs to be said. Okay. Um, it's good. I'm gonna leave my uh, screen off because my internet is bad, but just speaking to the PE increase at Doty and, and decrease at Rumney, it's um, we have it's it's the same uh, faculty member who is uh, affected by this, so it's still a 1.0, and it just makes the job more sustainable and more attractive as a long-term option for a really gifted teacher that we happen to have right now. And I think it's a good example of being able to be flexible and responsive to student needs. Thank you, Gillian. Next slide. So um, I, we just wanted to recap um, and share with you the school board parameters and where we think we are. So we think that draft 2A, um, it does check off social and emotional pillar. Again, we're, um, we're suggesting that we continue to maintain um, the school counselor, uh, counselor staffing as we have it this year. We think that we are addressing needs of uh, the multi-layered system of support. In addition to what we've increased recently around intervention, we're proposing increased intervention again at Callis for Literacy and in the RISE position at U32. We are currently under the penalty threshold based on prior years, even though it's not into effect, in effect, but we wanted you to see what that number is so you can see that we're below it in these drafts. We cannot check off the box for um, ed spending increase under 3%. So you see what those numbers are for draft two and draft 2A. That is still a work in progress. And we know that you as a board had expressed um, this parameter and some um, possibility for flexibility. Next slide. Uh, we have invested in hardening for software. Uh, draft 2A uh, reinvigorates or boosts uh, music. Again, we're proposing an increase in the elementary music overall of 0.3 FTE. And we're not quite ready to do contingency planning because there's still so much that is unknown. Um, so that's that summary. And then quickly, next slide, please, Mark. Again, sort of where we are, we highlighted in December, we're on the 15th, we're presenting these, um, these drafts to you for your feedback. We're gonna take your feedback and go back and work on draft three, and we'll have a community budget forum again on the 12th of January. 
And then next slide, please, Mark. Again, next steps, we're really um, interested in hearing from you so that we have some guidance. Um, and we will continue to um, think about, we want you to think about fund balance or not, um, continue to engage the public, and then we'll work on draft three accordingly. And as we get more information on the revenue side and some tax rate updates, we will share that with you as well. So Mark, um, you can stop screen sharing. Thank you so much for doing that. And um, we would just welcome your feedback and questions and concerns. Lindy. Uh, what is the current music FTE at East Montpelier when you're asking for 0.2 more? Currently it's a 0 0.6, three days a week. Diane. So thanks for the detail. I mean, it's very helpful, the detail. However, some of the um, proposals, I need some more specifics behind it. So yes, I know I looked at some, I remember seeing the numbers and that East Montpelier was the only school with an increase. I'm not understanding quite the correlation between an increase of two staff members. Not sure what that means in terms of the specifics. And then, um, so before I would feel comfortable saying, yep, move forward with two more positions, I'd need to have a better understanding of the breakdown. And some of this comes from last year, um, the transparency wasn't quite there. And so in terms of understanding what are the ripples and the impacts on each of our buildings, I just need some clarity. And so one of the clarity issues that I'm having too is, the reduction of the special educator at Berlin. My assumptions are that probably because they're district-wide employees that there might be a way of addressing needs and meeting needs, but I, sh I don't wanna work on assumptions. I need to know the specifics as to how um, we know that that impact is gonna be there. The, the other thing too is, um, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not clear how we're placing our priority in increasing music, but not increasing art. So I need understanding around that. Um, and then also, um, I need to understand, we created a, a, that pre-K role, that pre-K coordinator role. Thank goodness we did, Jen, because otherwise that would be an additional hat that you're wearing. So absolutely don't get me wrong there. However, I need to understand how that role is being used completely because it was also sold to us as though it was going to work toward increasing our um, connections and ability for programming for our pre-K. And so uh, just as an update around that as to um, what that looks like. So I, I think that, I think I dove in enough. Okay, can I? Can I answer? I, there are some that I can answer and that my colleagues can answer too. All right. Um, so first, I'm going to take them in the order. I think I heard them. Alicia, will you elaborate on the need for the 2.0 and that ripple effect? Sure. Um, so as Jen had shared that we created some recommendations last year and policy around class sizes based on different grade levels. Um, and given these recommendations, both before that came out and since, um, EMES class sizes have been very large um, to the point where seven out of 10 of our classrooms are larger than the recommended guidelines um, and will continue to be larger than the recommended guidelines next year. Um, in addition to that, over the past several years with our growing numbers, we've had to have a variety of multi-age classrooms based on numbers and solely based on numbers, not philosophy. Um, and those multi-age classrooms change from year to year depending on the numbers. So then it really impacts our curriculum because we may have a K-1 one year, a 1-2 the next year, a 2-3, and we can never really vertically align how we're teaching because we're constantly figuring out, do we go with second grade curriculum this year or third grade? Um, and that's a struggle we've had for the past several years. 
I think, but mainly because of the guidelines that have come out and just that our numbers are growing, we can't fit more children into our classrooms. Um, almost all of our classrooms have more than 20 students, including our um, kindergarten and first grades. So, it, and I'm sorry to break in, but that would be helpful for me as a board member to see what that looks like across the board, you know, at every school. Um, Cause what you're describing there is I know what I, we were struggling with at Berlin, you know, 10 years ago when I was there as well, it's that nature of it. But I absolutely hear what you're saying and I'm not saying it's not warranted, but I need to know what it looks like across the schools. And then I guess saying the other thing around that too is that then having more classrooms necessitates more time for the allied arts in the master schedule, right? That's more classes to go to, which is resulting in those increases in FTEs. The, you raised a question about special education at Berlin. There's not a, propose, a proposal to reduce it. It was a consideration to increase by another 1.0. So the stat, so that I think I must, I, I might not have been clear when I spoke about that. There's no, it's not about reducing. It was about additional. And Aaron, is anything you wanna to add to that one, Aaron? I think the slide might have had a little squiggle that made it look like negative. <laughs> um, oh, okay. we can clean up that slide. Okay. Yeah. But I, I mean, if you want, if you want me to speak to to that, I can. Um, uh, the we we have a lot of ways to determine what our special education numbers look like in in our schools, um, and oftentimes it's driven by by how many students you might have on a, on your caseload, and um, being at Berlin for four years. Um, I struggle with that not necessarily being what seems to be the deciding or best best way to measure meeting student needs. Um, so it's kind of a bigger conversation to have as a as a district. Um, but uh, you know we have a, a very transient population. Um, we have um, uh, our res residential program in our school. Um, uh, and the needs just seem to be getting higher. All of our pairs, or I should say most of our pairs are one-on-ones in the primary grades with students. Um, so we, we kind of, you know, we, we, we base our, our, our special ed educator teachers on, on, on how many kids they have on their caseload. But then when you look at schedules and, and, and needs and um, uh, just how the day looks, we find that we're kind of piecemealing things here and here and there, and it's never always the best case scenario for kids. It's like we want to be here, and we're always like right about here, and then just try to kind of figure out the rest when it comes to scheduling. So um, that's that's kind of the overall overall reasons for um, for that. Uh, your thank you, Aaron. Your third point was, yes, you're right. It, we focused more on music in this budget than art in this budget. And we know we had reductions last time. There's been a lot of conversation in the district and focus on music more than art recently. And we are trying to stay within the parameters that we had. So that's a conversation for you all to continue to, um, to have. And you've heard now three people speak about the art at point two, the increase, what that might do. Um, we just didn't present everything in, in this budget because we're trying to strike a balance um, based on the feedback that we've gotten and the parameters. And then the early ed role, that's probably um, maybe a, another conversation down the line around early ed in general. We've been spending a lot of time paying attention to access and schedules and uh, trying uh, to do our best around wrapping around for community connections and maybe a future topic could be more about early ed in that position in general. I'm going to say right now it's probably beyond the purview of this budget conversation. Thank you, Jen. We have other questions. Michaela, please go and then Maggie, you're on deck. <laughs> Um, thank you. So I just wanted to um, to comment also about um, that I would be, I would be all for seeing the the increase in art position included in a draft. Um, 
you know, based on our goals and, and what we've been hearing. Um, and also the, the food services, I think if I understood correctly, that position may not be needed next year, which is why it wasn't included. Um, that being said, you know, we talked about farm to table, um, like increasing that potentially. So I wonder if maybe including a position regardless would might be warranted that could help with more of a farm to table for each of the schools. Um, and lastly, you know, okay, I'm totally new to this process, of course, and um, full disclosure, I was raised by two um, families of educators. So I am really all for funding educators um, and schools as much as possible. So I would not be opposed personally to going above that 3% um, if it meant including these really important things. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan? Yeah, I just, this was just a question for Aaron. Is, Aaron, is it, um, do you need another full-time special ed position at Berlin at this time or projected going forward? Um, <clears throat> projected going forward. Okay, thank you. Maggie? I'm wondering if you could speak to how the changing in education funding, um, special education funding, I mean to say, plays into the um, planning around special education staffing. And I want to um, second the desire to um, fund the art position for the teacher currently teaching at Callis and East Montpelier, is that correct? Um, to full time, I, I'm speaking as a community member who specifically chose this district because of its robust arts offering in the public school community. So the question about special ed funding, <laughs> I'm going to ask both Suzanne and Kara to pipe in on this because there's sort of the funding side and there's just sort of the program programmatic shift side um, and thinking side. Sure. Suzanne, do you want to discuss the funding side? I can discuss the programmatic piece. Uh, I can. I think Maggie's direct question was, did the, the change in funding impact our decision in uh. the staffing? And I would yes. say, no, I don't think it did. We, we specifically talked about staffing and student needs um, prior to even knowing what those special ed revenues would look like. Maggie, did that answer your question or do you want yeah. more? Uh, no, I'm looking for more information because my understanding is we're going to a like a package, correct? Rather than per student expenditure. And as a special education clinician myself, as a speech language pathologist, I'm, I'm just wondering how this shift in like funding is affecting service delivery and how that is being reflected in our staffing looking forward because I'm, a, I'm under the impression that you all are working hard on implementing planning to implement changes next year based on, on the funding change. So yeah, I'd like more, more information beyond um, what we just heard about the finance. I'm happy to speak to that. I think it's, it's pretty broad. And um, at LMC, we had talked about the need to bring this to the board. And so that said, I'm happy to present to the board to, for more details around it. Um, you are correct in that we'll move from a reimbursement model to more of one chunk being um, allotted to the district. <clears throat> and then programmatically, the shifts will change in terms of eligibility for special education, but the emphasis will be placed more on tier one and tier two and moving towards an MTSS system, which is a hyper simplified, broad explanation. And I'm not sure how much time we have right now to go into it. Um, Can you at least just break down that acronym for all of us, please, MT? Yeah, it's more commonly called MLSS or an RTI model response to intervention, but the emphasis will be placed on providing intervention earlier at, in the classroom level and at 
the second tier of support from our interventionists in order to decrease the special ed need, which lines up with a lot of related to increasing pre-K um, and moving to an RTI model. It lines up with a lot of the initiatives and the priorities of the board. So are the, are the funding increases that are being planned, Berlin in particular, reflective of an anticipated increased need in the early ed community for those kids who are currently um, at the tier one and two, tier two level and the demands of doing more push-in classroom-based services rather than pull out, which I'm assuming is part of this model. I think that Aaron, um, Aaron, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Aaron's request related to a special education teacher relates more to the immediate needs within Berlin right now. Um, and it's not really an extension or um, of thinking about Act 173. In preparing for Act 173, it, I don't think it would look like hiring more special educators. It would be about making the classroom instruction more robust, as well as the intervention supports. So, uh, Maggie, I'm going to suggest that we we dig into Act 173 at a, at a later date. I, I think there's a lot of, I think two, the two main takeaways, like uh, Cara was saying is that we're going to move from a reimbursement model to a census uh, model, and then that there there is a lot of professional. So it's, it's a little bit not fair right now because there's a lot of professional development that needs to go in to accomplish the goals of Act 173. We're not there yet. It, none, and it's not just us. None of the districts of Vermont are there, and we don't even know if the capacity is there for the AOE to do that. So just because we really need to give them some guidance for the for, for the budget today, I'm, I'm gonna say that let's pick that conversation of Act 173 later. It, this is, you know, it's a moving target for all our districts. So let's move into the next question, uh, Chris McVeigh and then Stephen Luke. Um, so the, uh, what is the basis for thinking that the um, second um, teacher at East Montpelier is a one-time hire, which, which I interpret as being is needed for a year and then will go away. If is that correct interpretation of that? Jenny, I'm gonna speak. Yeah. Go, yeah, what's yeah, the basis? Alicia. Why do you think why do you think that staff member would not be needed after a year? Um good question. I'm glad you asked. So a year ago Are you sure? <laughs> yes. <laughs> a year ago, we had a teacher retire from EMES and that teacher's position, she was a classroom teacher and she moved into a coaching position in our school. She was part-time interventionist and part-time coach. And given COVID and given where we were at with test results and just um, bringing students back into the building after having been remote, our staff agreed that that position would best be served as a third interventionist in our school for this school year. And so we now have three interventionists in our building where prior to COVID we had two. My hope is that in a year from now, our students and will be in a better place so that we will no longer need three interventionists. And that position can go back down to two interventionists and move into the classroom. I don't see us needing fewer classroom teachers in a year from now, but the hope is, is that we will need one fewer interventionist. Does that make sense? Um, and it's a better explanation than what we, than what was presented. So, so it sounds like you're gonna need the second teacher in a year, but you hope that you won't need the interventionist and they Correct. can be a substitution of some kind of, okay. Correct. Um, and now a question for Aaron. Aaron? When you said uh, going forward for the special ed, does going forward mean now and for this upcoming school year? Yeah, I think that question was asked. Um, was I know, but you, well, you said going forward, which is kind next, of uh, big. Yeah, <laughs> I, I just think in uh, next year. So next school year, July? July. Yeah, that's, that's okay. yes. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, and now I need to clarify in terms of the reductions at Rumney, um, is it accurate that the reductions will result in no less student contact time with either the PE teacher or the art teacher? I'm talking specifically about student contact time, right? 
I heard the explanation about the art interventionist may be a problem uh, or art integration may be a problem, but in terms of current student contact time, these reductions will not reduce that. Is that, is that what I'm understanding? I can yes. speak to that, Jen. Yeah, thanks, Caroline. Sure. Yeah, just somebody signal me if um, if you end up not being able to hear me for unstable internet. Um, so it could be less contact with the teacher, but it's not because we right now have the teachers there more, and so they're in contact with students for things like integrated arts and unscheduled um, time that they support. But it's not less time in PE class that is like designed for PE or an actual general art class um, because all of the classes that we have and the same amount of art time um, can fit into a point four, which is two full days. Does that make sense? It, uh, so can I, can I just- Yep. In, in a very direct way, does it mean less opportunity for students because there's gonna be less teacher time in the building? Um, I, I don't know, that's tricky. Um, I guess the, the easiest way is just to repeat it, but I don't know that I'm answering your actual question um, because it's all the general art classes can occur in those two days. Um, but it's, it's the, you know, things like integrated art um, that students had access to because of having some extra unscheduled time. Um, and so that's where Alicia and I had talked and said, you know, if there's a specific thing that were to come up, um, any special circumstance or anything to continue a tradition, um, we would work it out so that Rumney could have um, some extra time to fulfill that. Um, so it's hard to say, you know, right now, if there's every time somebody is at school, they're having contact with with kids. Um, but in terms of like general art class and the schedule, that's not being affected. I just feel like I'm not, I, it's no, no, hard. You're, to you're not, that so we're, your we're, I think we're, I'm understanding that, you know, the formal, um, whatever the schedule is from nine to uh, nine fifty won't be affected. Um, but the, uh, what will be affected is the fact that the art teacher is in and a kid dropping into the classroom, it's kind of like the office hours are no longer there for that spontaneous, oh, I just want to drop in and see the art teacher. That's what I meant by opportunity. Yes. Those, those, not, those less formal opportunities. That's right. And times where, you know, teachers might um, go and to the art teacher for some unscheduled support if they're doing a special project. And that's really where, um, you know, Alicia and I would really work to design some specific time when there's like a specific need um, to, to share it a little bit differently. But in general, week to week, that is not being affected. What most kids access for art every week is not being affected. It's the things that come up that are, that are extras um, that happen occasionally throughout the year. Okay. Thank you, Caroline, very much. And, and thanks for everyone who answered my questions. Thanks, Chris. Stephen, thank you for being patient. So I have no objection to any of these positions or any of these changes. If they're that important, make them come in under 3%. Um, in my mind, that's what the board told you. you. We set the parameters, operate within the parameters. So if these are important, find out what you're not going to spend other money on. Stay under 3%. Thank you, Stephen. If I want other board members to have a chance to give their input on the budget. Um, Scott. Uh, I might just mention that when the finance committee met, um, we 
uh, if and, and please correct me if I say anything off. Um, we came out in favor of two A uh, because it was a thoughtful um, sort of uh, interpretation of what we were trying to do. Um, I'm uh, once again I'm I'm very sympathetic to Stephen's point of view. Um, the only reason why I'm I'm sort of bending on it is that we are in a really unusual situation um, where there is both bad news and good news. The bad news, everybody knows, the pandemic and all of the uproar that has accompanied that. The good news is that we're having, we're, we're, there's all of this money that we're flush with um, for a very limited period of time. So what we, uh, because the needs in, the, um, in, in our schools are so intense and um, uh, so driven by the current situation, and because it, it, it seems that we can afford it, we looked principally at, the, at what's going on with the tax rate. And um, I think, again, Please correct me if I if I stray from um, from what we actually talked about. But the um, uh, as Suzanne mentioned, there's the equalized pupils and the common level of appraisal that we still have to find out about, um, as well as I guess what the legislature and and governor decide to do about the state money, whether they. Um, you know, they use that for tax relief, uh, education tax relief. But um, if we have this, you know, this, um, instead of the biblical seven fat years, the uh, Vermont one or maybe two at best fat years, um, if we can actually do the right things for our students and have taxes still go down, let's do that. Um, one side note uh, on the um, on the art uh, question. Um, although you know, I, I guess it doesn't matter how I feel about it as an idea unto itself. But um, in order to avoid you know a procedural free for all, where um, just about anybody who has an agenda can kind of bring it to us and uh, do an end run around. The, the budget making system. I, I would prefer to have it, you know, thought about, vetted and presented to us in draft number three, rather than, you know, sort of make a statement on it now so that everybody in the system has a chance to, you know, do what they do in order to make sure that we have a coherent budget. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Jonas. Um, so I'm with uh, McHalen. Uh, I was also raised by a teacher. Um, I support spending on teachers and educators. I would have supported a, um, a higher uh, number than 3% uh, to give to the finance committee to build this budget. Um, and I want to note that last year, our spending went down in anticipation of possible tough times ahead. Those tough times continue, but our financial outlook and the financial outlook of the you know the Ed Fund uh, doesn't look as bad uh, as it possibly uh, did last year. Um, so, I have a couple of, of of questions for Suzanne and and Jen. Um, um, this year, you know, when it looks this year, when it looks like the tax rates will be relatively favorable to us. Does it make sense to spend more in this, the fat year, rather than uh, in future years? Is there a benefit to us spending, you know, spending, you know, on the, the other stuff that was, that's not in the budget that Jen outlined, um, you know, is, would it make sense to do that this year compared to other years? Um, and I guess the other two questions are related. What's the delta between budget 2A and the budget level that would cause us to go over the penalty threshold, understanding that that's not in effect. And 
what is the delta between 2A uh, net education spending and where it would need to be for taxes to remain level. Thank you, uh, Jonas. Uh, Jen? Yeah, so I, um, is there a benefit to spending more? I can't answer that question for you right this second. I would need to think that through and think through all the implications. I'm not savvy enough to answer that question off the top of my head, but I promise we can all talk through and get smarter about that. Um, and then the Delta, those are calculations that I think we can get for you, although I don't think that we can get them right in the minute, right the second, unless Suzanne thinks she can pull that off. The, the part about tax rate was to, I think, to, to Scott's question that really when we talk about money, we're talking about the tax rate. Correct. Suzanne, what, how might you answer that? What would you I say? Was, I was hoping Jonas could articulate it one more time because it, it I want to make sure I got exactly right. Yeah. What's the delta between, you know, the, the, the net education spending in budget 2A and what that number would look like uh, if the tax rates were flat? Right. So as of now, tax rates look like they're going down, what, like a penny and a half. Um, what would what would the spend look like if those numbers were essentially flatlined? OK. I, I would like to calculate that offline, if that's all right with you. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, yeah, and I'm, I'm not asking for like an, an exact number. You know, a ballpark would be would you can't give an exact number. I understand that. But okay. I think that that would be interesting to know. Yeah. OK, thank you. So I, I think we're giving you a lot of information to think about, uh, uh, Jen. I, I don't think that we're being completely uh, clear uh, quite quite yet. So I, I think we need to get a sense of uh, of the board. When when we gave you the parameters, it, to me it was it was just that it was that parameter. We we don't really completely understand the student needs in a way that you guys understand the the student needs. So this presentation has been super helpful. And if I'm uh, listening well to what the board what the board is saying uh, right now, in I'm, I'm sorry, Stephen, that I'm gonna sort of disagree with you in this one. There is an inclination to go to two A, which seems to be uh, what represents better the student needs, but there with a the caveat that you know that the additional staff for Berlin and Callas for art is uh, is uh, is is needed. So how do we but how do we fund that position? And then I am still not clear about that additional special educator position. Sounds like we need it. One of our pillars is really the social and emotional. It too, I don't know how that is integrated into that too, but it, that, that is not clear. We need more information on that. So I, I would suggest for, for the next, uh, we're gonna de need draft three. That, that we in include the Berlin and Callas uh, additional point 20 uh, art position. And that we include the, uh, what, what is the special educator position would look and what would that do uh, to the budget? And then I have a question for, for the board, uh, if we could think about using uh, some fund balance again for the equity scholar. Yeah. It's, it's just or I would also still need a, in a, a, a census breakdown of what it looks like in each of the buildings for the grade levels and for what that increase and where those numbers are looking. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. The, the, the notes that they, 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 they took. Uh, and then, you know, obviously our resources are finite, you know, finite or <laughs> however that's set properly. It, we don't have money to, to throw away. We did decrease that last year uh, at our finance committee. We talked about, you know, maybe we could call this the average of two years. There's danger in doing that, but we didn't really increase the budget last year. You know, let, you know, could we, you know, could we cut everybody a break because this is what it is. We do worry. And just so that the public is aware, we, we do worry about what X73 or what the potential waiting study is going to do with our uh, tuition. But you know we can we have to respond right now to what the student needs are. So I don't know if that makes it a little more clear. So taking into consideration all the questions that I see Suzanne writing, like and you, Jen, eh, as as crazy. I think we need to see draft three. We don't have a lot of time, right? Because in January we are going to need to really be eh, 
adopting a, a budget, but uh, I don't see any, it's, it, Jonas? Yeah, I'd, I'd like, you know, I, I respect what Steven said. I'd like to see what some cuts would be. Give us, mm -hmm. give us the, op uh, the opportunity to see what cuts look like. Chris. Um, I would also like to um, see as much directing, uh, direct funding as opposed to fund balance funding of, of positions that we think are important because doing it through the fund balance just creates the scenario for disappointment down the road when we don't have much fund balance. Uh, and, you know, but we still have these positions that we think are very important. So I think we should do direct funding for as much as we possibly can, just so we have a realistic budget that we're presenting to our community. And, and, you know, why don't we just dedicate our next meeting in January entirely to the budget so that we can have a, a, a debate and discussion um, about what we might see or not see, because we have to adopt the budget at that point, I think. So if we spend, do this front and center uh, and, and put off anything that's not urgent, I think that would be beneficial because we don't have robust discussion amongst all of us very much, I think. We just kind of throw out ideas and, and I think just having that dialogue amongst us would be helpful. And coming to a, um, a final budget with our with our administrators. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Any other comments? So, do you have enough to go from uh, Jen and Susan? Yeah, I just wanted to ask the rest of the leadership team because we've been working on this together. Leadership team, while we have the board here, do you have any other questions or concerns as we sort of take this feedback and go back and do draft three? I just want to make sure that I'm not missing anything that we might need. And Suzanne, yeah. Uh, I feel like we need some clarity on the direction for the equity scholar and residents. That wasn't clear for me. Yeah. So I think Chris just said to put it in the regular budget. My inclination to put it, it to be the only thing on the fund balance is because we are building our capacity right now. You know, we have this committee. We're going to hopefully build within our buildings the capacity. So the equity scholar is not something that we're going to need forever. Right. So but this was the first year that she was involved in the entire uh, district with all our schools. So so that was the only reason. But um, yeah, and I think I, I, think, I mean. I'll have that conversation with uh, with ILI and with Shelly um, in between that right in the next few days. So I'll be able to have more information to present to you in terms of a rationale for your consideration about a funding source. Okay. Yeah. Sounds and then we have, a, we have three hands up, Caroline, and then Alicia, and then Kat. Um, so for me, a couple things. One, I think it would be really helpful to summarize the consensus of what the board is asking us to come back with, because um, there were different opinions, and it's hard to then go back and do the work when, um, you know, some people were wanting it within the parameters and under the 3% and wanting to see what that would look like. Others were wanting um, something a little bit different. And um, but I just want to share my perspective, having um, been on the board doing budget last year and being part of the leadership team this year, that this draft, um, everybody worked together. Uh, the teamwork was great. And we worked really hard to stay within um, those parameters. We made really tough decisions. Um, and I think this is as close as you are going to be able to get um, to that percentage. I'm one voice right now, um, but I just wanna share uh, because I know there were a lot of questions in the past about um, you know, who supported what. Um, so this is a budget that I feel strongly that the whole leadership team does support. Um, I think if you are going to ask us to come back with like, what would it look like to stay under the three percent. There's going to be even more, um, you know, hurt feelings and things put out there that are not actually what we recommend. And um, I think that would be an unnecessary stressor at a time that's already um, pretty stressful. So that's my opinion. But thank you. Thank you, Caroline, for your insight, Alicia. Yeah, I would echo everything Caroline 
said, she said it beautifully. And it was also what I was going to say. I would just add uh, the question I have is, I heard two different things, one from Jonas and Steven saying, I'd like to see what the cuts were and bring it under 3%. So are you asking for two different versions, one being that and the other being also looking at adding those positions in that were in the other list? So if, if someone could just clarify that. Okay, I'm, I'm going to let uh, Kat answer a question and then we'll get back to, you know, sort of because I think they're going to be all aligned and then I'll have the board members speak. Thank you, Alicia. Kat? Uh, I don't want to take too much time. I did just want to put out a voice of appreciation for all of you to have such a thoughtful conversation and open dialogue with all of us. The leadership team, as you heard from Caroline and Alicia, we're really aligned wow. and feeling um, supportive of each other. And this conversation, this dialogue tonight, it felt like discourse rather than disagreement. And even if we're not all on the same page, and that's kind of a beautiful thing. I'm a process person, and this one is feeling like it has some integrity. I just want a, a shout out to the leadership team and the board for this opportunity. Big props to Suzanne for pulling us all together and for Jen for leading us home. So thank you. Thank you, Kat. Yeah. Jonas. You know, I certainly don't want to see two versions of the budget next, um, but I think it would be interesting to, you know, and I don't think that that's where the board is either, um, but I think it would be interesting to know what kinds of things we would be losing if we took 2A and got it under 3%. Just a ballpark. So I, in listening to- Directionally. Uh, yeah. In, in listening to the administrators, I think in one of the slides, Suzanne, I don't have it right in front of me and I have too many papers going in front of me. You had to get it under 3%, it was like 384,000 something. So I, I think you guys have already done that exercise. I don't think that we necessarily need to go back to getting you guys go through that. <laughs> we, it, it would, we would have to cut 384,000 more or less is what I wrote in my notes, but I don't have that slide in front of me. So, so, so we, we kind of have the answer to that. What we do need is more detail about the, the uh, Diane was asking, and that's more within the narrative of what the, the number 2A is buying us. And, and board members, please correct me if I'm wrong. I, I, don't, I don't think we can stay in the 3%. It's, uh, you, you guys made your case. You know, you made your case today. I, I see other board members chicken the herd. The finance committee met too, and we were all ready to support 2A. Uh, to after you know fine coming <laughs> what what we saw this was even more informative so I, I by all means do not want you to go and reinvent uh, the wheel I think we can uh, it was clear today from the meeting that we also have the interest in this other position so what does that do to the number that we are right now you know we have to respect that conversation that was not included it was it was different so let's Let's add that to that. If the number, the 384,000 need to increase to show us what it would be to be under 3%. But I, I don't think, I, I think you guys already know <laughs> what, what that means. So please don't go like back again to trying to, you know, get it from Peter to Paul or whatever it, to each other. I think you guys have made that, that, that exercise. We need to continue to move, uh, it, to move forward with the input that you received. It today. Does that make it clear? So not going to a 3%. Kari? Yeah, I wonder if it would be proper to uh, formally remove the parameter about 3%. And that way it's, it, it's removed from future presentations and the staff is getting the direction that we're not, we're not expecting that. I, I think that makes total sense if you wanted to make a motion. And it's not just because poor Stephen just headed to a class, so he had to leave us at nine o'clock. So I feel bad for Stephen, but I know that he will understand. So, yeah. so I'll, I'll make the motion to remove the parameter of 3%, but, but not remove the parameter about preparing some contingencies. Okay. Lisa, was that clear to you? I mean, is it clear to the leadership team? Yeah, hold on. When I mean, those, that's, those are the ones it needs to be clear to. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because that's who we're expecting to come back. Thank you. 
Okay, so Kyrie moved in, uh, Chris second it. Uh, so is it clear to the leadership team? I think that was clear. That cleared everyone? And, yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. And this, uh, you got it in the minutes? We're removing the parameter? Okay, we got it. We need to vote. Yeah, one. <laughs> <Did we? laughs> All those in favor, please say aye. <laughs> I'm coming. Aye. 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 Okay. aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Okay, thank you for that conversation. I'm sorry it took too long. I am outdoing myself and I'm a little worried that some of you are not home and need to get home. So let's move right along into, if I can find my budget. We don't, uh, we're not making any decisions on that. So unless there's questions, please, I'm just gonna move us right along to the policy committee. Okay, the um, only policy that we have up for um, at the second reading is A, well then no, not A plus one, I'm sorry, hold on. D7, a special education. Yeah, one, is that 166? Uh, yes. No, 168, page 168, D7, Special ed education, um, you know, fairly straightforward. Uh, the one thing I, I don't think that we, when we discussed this, uh, we talked about the Vermont Special Education Procedures and Practices Manual. And I think Lindy reached out to a friend of hers and the friend said that the manual had not been developed yet at the time that we met. Um, so it was with it the attorney. Be, what? It was with the attorneys. It <laughs> hadn't been approved. Okay. So it, it may not necessarily be on the website at this time if we approve this policy, but that will be in the offing, as I understood it. Correct. Thank you, Lindy. Um, so any questions on, uh, is there a motion? Scott? I'll move, I'll move that the board approve policy D7. Thank you, Scott. Hey, could we have a second? Second. second. Ursula, you, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> everybody was <laughs> at the same time. I gave it to Ursula. Hey, so. Everybody's ready to get home. Oh yeah, any discussion? Okay, all those in favor of approving D7, please say aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Thank you, Chris. Can we, can we yeah. say the, the motion Bradley's? Sorry, what did you say? The motion Bradley's for Carrie Bradley. Oh, oh, say the motion for Ka No, these uh, are. He's punning. Chris, he's punning. Uh, 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 okay, got it. I, I'm like, like, my brain is starting. To, it's been a long day. So approve the minutes. Could I have it's a motion? It's too late for punning. Yeah, approve the minutes. Thank I you. I move to approve the minutes. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Jonas. Jonas. I second. I'm oh, sorry. I missed it. Maggie second. No, Lindy. Lindy second. Any discussion? Scott. Scott, go just, ahead. Just two things. Thanks. Um, on page 170, under 3.2 public comment, um, looks like it's about five lines down. Uh, Dexter Lefevre, I believe, spells his name L E F A V O U R if I'm not mistaken. Is that, is that good? And, and on December 1st, um, although I was evidently uh, there and mentioned as speaking on a couple of occasions, I didn't make the roster of those present. So um, Thank Maybe you. that was referring to my the nature of my mind at the time, but. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. So all those in favor of approving the minutes with the amendments proposed um, by Scott. Can I, I have a, a question? Yeah. Dexter tonight was concerned about that the minutes did not reflect his comments. Um, I wasn't at that meeting, so I don't know what he might have been referring to. I don't think he specified. Does anybody else have a sense as to whether or not um, the minutes 
on 170 reflect accurately reflect Esther's comments? I think they reflected it at a level of generality that's appropriate for the minutes. I, I agree with that. Okay, I just I raised it because you raised it earlier. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. yeah. It's it's right. It's it's right there. So it is. It, it, it covers. All those in favor of approving the minutes as amended, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none. The motion carries. And now we're going to approve board orders. Lindy. I can't do it tonight. My computer okay. died on my iPad and I can't open both. <laughs> okay. Uh, a volunteer, Kari, Diane. You're muted, Diane. Okay. So, oh, but now I don't know quite the word. So I move that the board approve. Uh, the board orders for the uh, in the amount of and I don't have it totaled in the amount of one million three hundred and eighty six thousand three hundred and fifty one dollars and forty five cents and eight thousand three hundred and eighty nine dollars and ninety three cents. Oh, it's totaled at the bottom. I didn't scroll down. Would you like me to read the total? Sure. For yeah, it's one million three hundred and ninety four thousand seven hundred and forty one dollars and thirty eight cents. Thank you. A second, please. Second. Thank you, Ursula. Any discussion? No Just remember up. to sign the warrant when it comes. Yeah, yeah, sign. <laughs> Just remember to respond to the email and you'll get an email in a few minutes uh, and sign it remotely. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. And now let's move into approve the, the new teachers. And we actually, we had an extension of uh, leave first. Jonas? I move, yeah, I move to approve an extended leave of absence request uh, for Christiana Martin uh, for the period of January through June to 2022. Thank you, Jonas. Could I have a second for that? Second. Up. Thank you, Diane. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. And now the long term subs, Jonas, please. I move to approve uh, long-term substitutes for the 2021-22 school year. Uh, uh, Kieran Owen as a long-term math substitute at U32 and Katya Brockelmans Puig, a long-term elementary math substitute in Berlin. Second. Second. Thank you, McKinney. <laughs> <laughs> McKinney. Uh, all those in favor of approving the subs, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. And that brings us to an end of our meeting. Uh, uh, well, update on Four. vacancies. Update yeah. on vacancies, okay. Update on vacancies. So um, some of these are unchanged. Quickly, uh, we ha still have a lead maintenance position at Berlin open. We have driver's education at U32 open. We partially filled the lit interventionist position at Callis. We'd like to fill it even more. We have a partial administrative assistant at Doty open still. We have a student behavior support position at Rumney that is still vacant. We are uh, still looking for a site coordinator for community connections at Rumney and Doty. We have some para and BI needs across the district. We're filling some, but we still have a few. And we will have a vacancy in the beginning of January for a driver um, who helps us uh, with some driving support. Those are our current vacancies. Thank you so much, uh, Jen. Yeah. Board, uh, we have the the entire future agenda items. I'm I'm gonna take the liberty to table that 
today and leave it to the steering committee to 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 look at that. Uh, any board uh, reflections? Jonas. I want to thank uh, Maggie and um, uh, 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 Maria and Jen uh, for helping to uh, turn around some of the uh, misinformation that uh, people listening to the board meeting were exposed to. I think it's very important that we um, that we push back against that when it comes in front of us. Thank you, Jonas. Jonas, I think you meant McKaylin, but I just both. Yeah, both. Uh, oh, is it? McKay Sorry, my bad. Both, both of them. Uh, uh, Carrie. For the meeting um, recap, I thought we'd focus mainly on the budget including um, inviting people to the next forum on the 12th, but then also talk a little bit about the appointing of members to our superintendent search and screening committee, and also the um, superintendent's report um, regarding COVID safety measures and the um, vaccination rates at our schools. How's that sound? That sounds great. I will add uh, our decision to stay remote. Okay, yep. Kari, I would also suggest um, a highlight of the audit just because of the yep. fact that we went through a transition and a, a tough time. So something celebrating that excellent Great. audit. Yeah. Good. Anything else? I, I would add, uh, you know, a staff uh, appreciation too, just because we're headed towards the holidays. That would be probably the last update from the board. So just to thank you for what we've been doing to all of them for what they do every day for us in our community. Okay. I'd, I'd like to add the ongoing efforts to um, manage the COVID crisis in, in the school environment and also continuing to provide testing, which as our U32 students spoke to really gives peace of mind, not just to students, but to families, um, because testing in the community can also often be challenging to obtain in central Vermont after school hours. Great. Okay. And now let's move into public comments unless there's anything else from the board. I don't see anything. Yeah. And I actually don't see any hands up. So I, I have a request that um, that we at some future meeting discuss the recent arbitra arbitration decision regarding the health care um, and whether or not to um, send some resolution to the negotiating board. It seems like the negotiating is not doing a very good job, in my view, um, on uh, at least in some of the tactics. It just sounds like they were taking the task a little bit um, on, our, on, on the board's behalf. Um, and it's the second arbitration that we've lost in a row. Um, so I think we would like to have a discussion if we can try and direct them to take a different tactic when it comes up next. Um, just, it seems like vinegar is not working. Honey might. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Okay, there's no public comment. So a motion to adjourn and thank you everybody. For All right. All right, see you. Have a happy holiday, everyone. Okay, so Chris moves. Uh, who seconds? Second, me. Okay, Chris and Jonas. I'm sorry to move us so quickly through this no, last piece. And happy holidays, everybody. Yeah. And have yeah. a good time with your families. Hi. Aye. 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 <laughs> All those in favor, please say aye and leave aye. again. And safe travels. Good home. night. Thank Bye. you. Hi. Good night. Thank you.